welcome to Death Valley. The LSU Tigers take the field here in front of their home crowd, the fourth-ranked team in the country, with an in-state foe tonight. Welcome to SEC Saturday night. And there is a sense of excitement and energy around this LSU program, the likes of which we haven't seen in years. It is all predicated on promise. And tonight, they look to win another against an in-state foe. Welcome, everybody. Tom Hart alongside Jordan Rogers. The promise and the excitement is based on what happened last week against Texas and how it happened. The offense is finally here. It's led by Joe Burrow. You know, I was hesitant this offseason when Orgeron said, we're going to open it wide up. Joe Brady made me optimistic last week against Georgia Southern. I felt a little bit more of what this offense could look like, but last week against Texas, this offense arrived, and the quarterback leading the charge, Joe Burrow, stepped onto the Heisman stage with his performance. This offense is electric. Joe Burrow is a different player this year. I needed to see it against Texas. I saw it, and this offense is going to be fun to watch, and the SEC and the rest of the country is on alert. They're on a historic pace. It's not just a quarterback, Joe Burrow, but he's got plenty of weapons at his disposal. For more on that, let's go down to the field. Here's Cole Kublik. Tom, speaking of history, history made with these LSU wide receivers last week against Texas with three going over 100 yards. That had never happened in school history. I asked wide receiver coach Mickey Joseph, why is it different? What's different about this group? He said, you know, honestly, it's really not. It was an unselfish group when they got here, and since Ed Orgeron took over, he's been preaching one team, one heartbeat. He said our room sort of took that mantra on for themselves, and he said, therefore, they're not a group that understands that there's one football. They're not going to get it on every play, so they're okay running defensive backs off and doing little things that are going to help other receivers in that room have opportunities. Justin Jefferson and Terrace Marshall were two of those receivers that went over 100 yards last week. We'll see a lot more of them tonight. All right, Cole, thank you. So LSU undefeated 2-0, a top five team in college football. Their opponent tonight is one that has never beaten LSU. Northwestern State is 0-11 against the Tigers. They're 0-2 on the season. If you're Northwestern State, what are the goals for tonight? Well, it's uh, still in the middle of a rebuild for this program, but if you're one of the better players at Northwestern State and in the Southland Conference, you probably were a little overlooked in high school, and this is your chance to kind of measure yourself up against the talent at LSU and everybody else. You get to tell your kids for the rest of your life you played at Tiger Stadium. At Northwestern night, State, 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 State. Well, this was the scene before the game today. Their head coach, Brad Laird, told us that when we get there, we're going to look around a little bit. We're going to appreciate it. A lot of these guys played at Kyle Field last year against Texas A&M. And he said maybe early the nerves were too much. They jumped off sides three of the first four offensive plays against A&M. It will be a different type of sound. The nerves were too much last year, and this stadium is even a little different at night here. So I expect some mental mistakes. You expect that out of Northwestern early, but some of that leadership that's been there and done it before will be their job to rally the troops and get everybody focused early. You heard the coin toss. LSU won it. They've elected to defer. So Northwestern State will receive to Northwestern State offense and wants to put the ball in the air a lot. Their quarterback leads the FCS in completions per game. And they know, look at this, they're going horns down still. Looks like Joe Burrow's dad started a trend. Clyde Edwards-Alaire continued it for LSU. And the remnants of that Texas victory might just stick around for a while for this LSU team. Thanks to that win in Austin, they have one of the most impressive, if not the most impressive, early season resume of anyone in college football. And if they can stay perfect, Ed Ogeron's team himself, the Northwestern State product, will take another step towards what they hope to be a championship season. LSU in the home purple for a change with white trousers and white helmets, the color of royalty here in Baton Rouge. And Avery Atkins will get us started. Miles Ward is deep to receive for Northwestern State. And here we go on a Saturday night in Death Valley. No chance for a return, and Shelton Epler will lead Northwestern State onto the field. He won the job last year. He's a guy that played offensive line 
in high school. Played just down the road from College Station, Texas, in Navasota, where he set a Texas prep record with 71 touchdowns as a junior. Athletics runs in the family. His brother Tyler plays professional baseball, played overseas in Japan. Epler leading FCS, 35 and a half completions per game, 104 attempts, tied for the most in all of major college football. Expect tempo and expect Epler to sling this thing all over the field to get things going. They go trips right. Jared West is his running back. West with an early touch, and he'll grind it out for three yards up the middle. This is an LSU team that is incredibly talented defensively. They're missing some of their stars to that in a moment. But as we take a look at the starting lineups, it's a Northwestern State team that loves to put the ball in the air. Highlighted by Texas Tech transfer Quan Shorts. And in week one, Quan Shorts had 11 receptions in the first half. I expect Epler to go to him frequently. The former Texas Tech transfer. This stage is not going to be too big for him, and they're going to need some plays tonight. There are favorite receivers, and then there are locked-on receivers, and that's exactly what he does with Shorts as he finds LeVar Gums, who gets his first start and a completion of eight yards. I like the plan already for Northwestern State on offense. Spread them out, make sure that Epler can see pressure when it comes, and distribute the ball quickly. They're going to have to because Damone Clark, along with a few others, are going to be coming after Epler as much as possible. I'll tell you about some of the lineup and personnel changes in a moment. Epler rolls right, lets it go up his foot, and it falls incomplete. Michael Divinity Jr. is uh, one of the guys that won't play today due to coach's decision. Three others defensively injured. Caleb on chase on the fantastic rush in. Richard Lawrence inside and Glenn Logan all missing this game. They all had injury issues against Texas. And that's unfortunate. Obviously, this is a good week to hopefully get some guys healthy. But Dave Aranda, the defensive coordinator for LSU, mentioned they want to work on their pass rush. Get things going with that many guys out. Going to have a lot of opportunities for young guys and inexperienced guys to work off the edge. On second and ten, Epler, a little bit of time and an in route, complete for five yards. And he's able to find Gavin Landry. Landry a walk on. Coach Laird said he's the hardest working player on the roster. Played primarily special teams as of a couple of years ago. Third down. LSU wants to develop a pass rush. Keep an eye on Ray Thornton right there off the edge. Extremely athletic. Working on left tackle, Jonathan Hubbard. Hit as he throws. It's complete for a Northwestern State first down. That's Quan Shorts, senior from Humble, Texas, by way of Texas Tech. And watch the pressure. Thornton's going to loop all the way inside here, and he is just a step late. But he's got great speed. One of those guys Aranda needs to develop. He's a 4-5 or five guy. Says he's a little skinny right now. Like him to add on a little weight. But he's one to keep an eye on, especially with Caleb on chase on and Michael Divinity out of the game. Let me know if he needs advice on how to put on some pounds. First and 10 across midfield. Can't go much better for Northwestern State on this opening drive. This is Jared West. And West will rumble for five. Jacob Phillips with the stop. LSU does not figure to be tested today. We know they are heavy favorites in this game, but still, you take away your three starters on the defensive line and your starting linebacker, there's got to be a little bit of inconsistency to be expected. Absolutely. I mean, do they have better athletes? Yes, absolutely. But anytime you make a good athlete think about his responsibility, there's a little hesitation already early. We're seeing Northwestern State has the jump in the trenches so far. Second down, five. And they're going to run it, needing five, and they will get it. A first down run again by Jared West. And it's able to, he's able to pick up six, needing five. So I told you about some guys inactive today, mainly due to injuries, but others missing due to coach's decision, including Michael Divinity Jr., Jamar Chase, and the tight end Thaddeus Moss. And as this team looks for a dominant pass rusher outside Caleb on chase on, it was going to be Michael Divinity, but that's what I'm watching for tonight. Who's going to step up? Ray Thornton, Damone Clark, and some others have an opportunity. You can add a name to that list. Justin Thomas, yeah. defensive end, also not expected to play today. Little toss to West. He is carrying the load here on his first possession as he picks up one. The fantastic freshman cornerback. 
Derek Stingley Jr. brings him down. This guy has already impressed and he's only played two games. And sitting down with the Randy said, tell me about this guy. He goes, he's a different dude. From a standpoint of natural athleticism, instincts, the plays he makes. I mean, as soon as he stepped on campus, he was one of the best, if not the best corner they had. He was able to shut down Colin Johnson last week against Texas. A 6-6 wide receiver. Five wide here for Northwestern State. Epler to the out route and that is caught by Quan Shorts and it's a gain of two. So if there's a concern for this LSU defense Texas may have exposed it a couple elements to it the inability to get to the quarterback and then the inability to slow down a passing game. And it really starts with affecting the quarterback obviously Ellinger last week his ability to run the football slowed that down a bit. But as LSU mans up across the board, this is where Shelton Epler needs Quan Shorts to make a play. Epler looking that way, goes to Shorts. It was wide and it's incomplete. Coverage by Kerry Vincent Jr. And the fourth and seven now for Northwestern State. They're going to leave the offense on the field. That was another twist on the outside for this Dave Aranda defense. The third time that he's run it today, you want to know how you find a pass rush? Sometimes it's going to be games, not just guys winning one-on-ones. Northwestern State, three of six on fourth down this season. Why not? Ray Thornton got to the quarterback last third down. Keep an eye on him here on fourth. Epler. Incomplete, trying to find shorts again. That time, Damone Clark brought the pressure. The Northwestern State with a promising opening drive, but they turn it over on downs. We'll see Joe Burrow and this LSU offense on the field right after this. and LSU, a top 10 showdown on Saturday night. Can you feel the taking over all your senses? Burrow, right back at it. You better be taking notes and watching Joe Burrow. Dude, this is 2019 LSU. We're here to win. We're here to play for championships. Can you feel the rise? He finished with a wave. He started with a flourish, and he walked out of Austin with a victory. And the secret was him going downfield. Joe Burrow's second in school history with 471 yards against the Longhorns last week. And he picks up right where he left off. With a diving catch by tight end Steven Sullivan. And a pickup of eight. And LSU will go no huddle and up tempo. They want to get this thing rolling again. Clyde edwards Alaire is a running back. Alaire stretched out and a stutter step to allow him to bend back inside for the first down. Love the tempo that LSU brings. And when you watch this offense, if you're looking for what is so different this year, 
Watch the formations. Yes, you see the tempo, but watch how often you have receivers and tight ends attached in condensed formations to create space on the outside. Burrow looking downfield. Flush from the pocket on the run. And now we'll try to tuck it. And he gets taken down by a trio of demons, but picks up four on the way. That time trying to take a shot downfield. And that's another thing that's different. Last year, a lot of play action from under center. Two and three man combinations. This year, you'll see four, five wide receivers and a running back in routes at the same time, which gives Burrow the opportunity to stress the entire defense. And already you see one of these bunch condensed formations to create space. Edward Zolaire changed the direction in the backfield. Showed you the graphic earlier, but a reminder, Burrow is without a couple of weapons offensively. Wide receiver Jamar Chase, tight end Thaddeus Moss, both being held out of this game by head coach Ed Ogeron. With Thaddeus Moss out, you're going to see number 10, Steven Sullivan, in the game quite a bit. 6'5", 242 pounds here. He is a weapon, a guy they can have in at tight end or split out at receiver. And there's going to be a mismatch wherever he lines up. Sullivan got a lot of work in practice on Thursday. He's trying to clear the way, and they go over the middle. And that's caught and hauled in by the senior tight end. It's a pickup of nine. This is a levels concept. We're going to see this a lot. You got two under routes crossing, a dig right behind it. That's one of the reasons that Joe Burrow has targeted the middle of the field so frequently, something Joe Brady brought to this offense that's new this year. It's a brand new offense for LSU. Burrow pulls it back, waiting for the play to develop. Sideline shot and incomplete. And flag coming. Joe Burrow told us that a week after the bowl game, after Brady was hired, they called him into the offense and they handed him the new playbook. He said, I flipped the first page. He said, that's new. Second page, new. Third page, new. Fourth. Whoa, this is not a refinement. This is a reload. And that's really what I think everybody, including myself and all the LSU fans this offseason, have wondered just how different was it going to be. Pass the defense. defense. On the defense. 15-yard penalty, penalty from the previous, previous spot. spot. This is a throw that, that Burrow will want back. The good job not overthrowing. You never want to overthrow a guy, but you get that ball up, you allow Sullivan to use his 6-5 frame. I was so impressed with the receivers able to make plays downfield uh, last week against Texas. This is complete to Justin Jefferson. And Jefferson takes it inside the 15. So Stephon Sullivan, Justin Jefferson, and others already in the flow. That's a gain of 11. This has been a surprising area that they've attacked in the middle of the field in a couple games too, Jordan. The LSU last year would not go to the end zone in the middle of the field. Demons taking a couple of guys off, and they are in disarray defensively. O'Shea Jackson was late coming back. They whistled that thing dead, and it looks like Northwestern State was able to get a timeout. Adrian Robertson starting a linebacker. Timeout. Northwestern North State. State. That, is that is their first, first charge timeout, timeout of the half. half. Robertson uses the timeout. They'll try to get fixed defensively. First possession for LSU continues after this. No, oh, second year starter Joe Burrow for LSU. Well, his dad and his brothers both played at Nebraska, so he grew up a big Nebraska fan, was Ohio Mr. Football, went to Ohio State to play for Urban Meyer, and his dad, Jimmy, well, he became very popular around these parts because once he flashed the horns down and Joe said, man, that's not like my dad. That might be like me, but that's not like my dad's personality. It's the first time in 51 years that his dad has been free, not on the field in the fall, able to follow his son around the SEC. I love it. Dad just wants to go viral a little bit. Let's go. <laughs> so, <laughs> Torrey Carter is in as an H-back for LSU now. Opening drive continues for the Tigers. Light Edwards, Hilaire bottled up in the backfield, and they'll go backwards for the first time. Red zone has been an area, as Cole mentioned, that this LSU offense looks completely different. All of last year, 
Joe Burrow had 13 completions in the red zone, five touchdowns, three interceptions. This year, he's already got six touchdowns. They are throwing the football. They are being aggressive in the red zone. You see here, condensed sets. Wouldn't, wouldn't be surprised if we see a corner route by Jordan Jeff or excuse me, Justin Jefferson. On second and 11, complete. And inside the 10 goes Derek Dillon. I want you to explain to me, maybe not now, but later in this game, how bunching personnel closer to the ball allows you to spread things out. Yeah, they love corner routes. They love out routes from these condensed sets. You have a lot of field on the outside, and defenders have to decide they're going to play you tight or are they going to play outside of you and take away that leverage? It really just puts the defense in a bind and allows these receivers to work in space and use their athleticism. They're going to leave the offense on the field looking at a fourth down. It's fourth and four for LSU. And Ed Ogeron says, let's use a timeout. And let's think about this. Timeout. LSU. LSU. Joe Burrow is, is a quarterback with timeout. confidence. And if you ask him, I bet he'd say, let's stay on the field. Forget about the first down. Let's pick up a touchdown. What can Joe Burrow show in this game to build off of Texas, given the opponent and the expectations? I think just continued growth and consistency. That's one thing last year. He had the talent. You saw flashes of it. There was just inconsistency, and, and when you watch film of last year, some of that's on Joe, a lot of that's on the offensive scheme, the youth at receiver, youth and inexperience up front. There's a lot of blame to go around, but I want to continue to see consistency because I think this offense sets him up to use his strengths the best, and that's why we saw the performance that we did last week. 26-yard attempt for Cade York out of McKinney, Texas. He was 3-for-3 three three against Texas in his home state last Saturday night. And he bangs that one through as LSU is able to score on its first possession. They're able to cap a lengthy drive, and it's 3-0 Tigers. Prime time is back on Sunday nights, marrying exclusively on ESPN Plus at 7.30 p.m. Eastern all season long. Welcome back to Death Valley here in Baton Rouge. Tom Hart, Jordan Rogers, Cole Kublik, and our fantastic SCEC Network crew. Northwestern State turned it over on downs, their first possession. LSU stymied between the tackles on theirs and able to add a field goal. Avery Atkins puts it in the air for the Tigers and drives it through the end zone. So LSU tries to continue its success against in-state foes. They haven't lost to one since Tulane in 1982. It's a stretch of 30 consecutive wins at that far from Natchitoches to Baton Rouge and a lot of Baton Rouge guys playing on this team for the Demons. And of course, LSU head coach Ed Ogeron has ties to the school. His buddy Bobby Abair convinced him to come up to Northwestern State and play football with him after he originally came here. And he said he has so many people there to thank for his career. In fact, it's exactly where his coaching career got started after a failed tryout with the Memphis Showboats. Ogeron showed up for the tryout. His name wasn't on the list. They allowed him to try out. They didn't care for him. They moved back to Natchitoches, and he said, I'll just take my cot into the visitor's locker room and live there if that's okay with everybody else. And that was the birth of this coaching career. How about that? Unbelievable story. And an unbelievable mullet. Are you yes. kidding me? Bebe looks good back then. It's going to come back around. Everything does. Short shorts are in now. That mullet's coming. I can't wait to see it. He was a team captain in 1983. He won the inaugural Joe Delaney Leadership Award. Joe Delaney could have been the best player to ever come out of Northwestern State. Was the AFC Rookie of the Year. The Chiefs it died tragically in a drowning accident in his first offseason. Brad Laird, the head coach for Northwestern State, also won that award. He was a quarterback there. We got a flag in the tail end of this play after a gain of seven. So there are a lot of ties between these two programs. Michael Moten is our umpire. Lee Hedrick, our referee.
personal, personal foul. foul. Chop block, Chop block. On, the, on the offense, offense. number 74 and 75, and 75 in a high-low high combination. combination. After this, After this is the goal from the previous spot. spot. A couple of upperclassmen, Chris Zirkel at left guard and senior Dustin Barnes at center. Zirkel's the nominee for the AFCA Good Works team. Not exactly a Good Works kind of move to go high-low, <laughs> draw, draw personal foul. He flips a switch between the hashes, you know? I guess so. I'll give Zirkel credit. That is an offensive lineman kind of name. <laughs> They're watching it on the big board. Zirkel and Burns. It might not be Zirkel. Nope. Oh, they're leaving it. All right. I think he's still on the good works list for now. For now. Second and 19. Epler looking for a screen. They got room for Jared West, and he takes it back all the way to the 25-yard line. A gain of 12. Cole, are you surprised from what you've seen in the trenches here early in this one? Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm surprised that Northwestern Saints had a little bit of success in the run game, albeit most of it outside on the perimeter, I think trying to stretch that defense out so maybe they can find something inside later on. That gain leaves him with a third and 10. Four-man rush. Epler's strong arm. Complete pass midfield. And a Demon's first down on a 28-yard strike to Akile Davis to transfer from BYU. That is a great play design. Open up the defense playing black bracket coverage which means you're going to isolate this safety. He's supposed to stay over the top on that half of the field, but you stretch it to the middle. Now he's split between his responsibilities and late in a great throw by Epler. Epler with the toss to West. And West gets bottled up and dropped. It's a loss of three that time. Braden Fajoko with the stop, along with Neil Farrell Jr., Fajoko is another one of those guys they really need to start developing consistency up front. He flashes, but Dave Rand was saying once he gets in the flow of the game, has a tendency to get outside of his responsibility. Mm -hmm. And he'll make a few plays doing that, but more often than not, it can hurt the defense as a whole. Really needs to stay within his role, be consistent, and make plays within the scheme. On second and 12. Going with a screen of the wide receiver and crawling his way is Akile Davis. His former teammates, BYU, got a big win this afternoon against USC the last two weeks. BYU has taken down USC and Tennessee. 20 years ago, that would have been real big time. <laughs> right now, it's uh, <laughs> doesn't quite have the same ring, but still impressive. Fair point. And Lexington, Kentucky leads Florida 14-7. That's a huge one in the SEC East. Third down, eight. Pressure coming. Epler over the middle, complete to shorts in a first down. Dave Aranda is trying to figure out how he can get pressure on the quarterback. Yeah, he'd really like to apply pressure with a four-man rush, but we're already seeing early as they bring four here in a creative way. He said yesterday, we can't just line up and rush right now. We're not good enough on the outsides to win one-on-one. -on -one. we got to get creative with stunts, with twists, and what he calls creepers coming from the second level and sometimes dropping those ends off to create an exotic four-man rush. Northwestern State. Shifts into the trips on the left side. Late in the first quarter. And first touch for Stadford Anderson. Able to pick up two on the right side. Neil Farrell Jr. with the stop for LSU. First stringers Glenn Logan, Rashard Lawrence, and Caleb on chase on. All on the defensive line, out for LSU in this one. Also missing, linebacker Michael Divinity Jr. Second down, eight. Epler with a check. Mm. 
Play clock at seven. And he'll have to burn a second timeout. Timeout, Northwestern State. That is their second charge timeout. Of the Boy, half. won't it be interesting if that timeout matters late? It's 3 0 LSU. Thanks. Go figure in Kentucky. He'd be a former basketball player making a big play on the football field. Great crowd at Kroger Field tonight in Lexington. Out of the timeout, Shelton Epler and Northwestern State looking at a second and eight, their second possession of the night. Epler deep ball batted down, and we got a flag on the play. And maybe an injured player on the play. Todd Harris was able to make the play, but he immediately went down looking like he's grabbing his right knee. Pass interference on the defense, number four. 15 yard penalty from the previous spot. Automatic first down. Student section disagreed with the call. Just a little bit. Here's a look. You're going to say he just initiated contact a little early. Let's see if this angle coming over the top. You know, it's really, I don't think it's so much as the contact as maybe the back judge there sees that left hand wrapped around the shoulder of the receiver. There's not a lot of early contact. It's a really good position that Todd Harris was in. And not even that that arm affected too much, but if a ref sees that arm up on the shoulder of a receiver, probably going to throw that every time. Jack Marucci and his athletic training staff tending to safety Todd Harris. It's a secondary that struggled last week against Texas. They gave Sam Ellinger time to throw. And he took advantage of it, full advantage of it. Yeah, I think Christian Fulton, Grant Delpit, both didn't have games that they'd probably be too proud of. I mean, they had good moments, and really it wasn't that bad. I mean, Texas made some plays on the outside when they had to on 50-50 balls, and anytime you have a running quarterback, that adds another wrinkle to the defense. So a few things need to get cleaned up, but... Still a lot of positive to take away from the direction this defense is going in the secondary. Although they still have a lot to figure out with this pass rush and how they can affect the quarterback down the road in the SEC, which they're going to need to do. Todd Harris will be helped off the field. Texas Saturday night was able to score in seven of their last eight drives and turn that thing into a Big 12 shootout. Made for great television ratings. Not good for defensive coordinators. After the penalty, first down. Epler looking in zone, fires, caught shorts, has it. Touchdown. Northwestern State. It's the first ever score for Northwestern State in the history of this series. First ever touchdown, excuse me, comes in the 12th meeting, and it's a 17-yard strike. Wow. How about Northwestern State? Brad Smiley, the offensive coordinator, has come in here with a great plan. Had a trips cluster to the field here. Little levels, a corner with the flat underneath it. Quan Shorts out leveraged the DB and a good ball. Really on the back hip to Quan Shorts by Shelton Epler. Made that happen. Or wow. the Western State have been outscored 516 to 3 in this series history before that drive. And now the Demons, Brad Laird's squad, have an early lead. Juan Shorts wants to see how he stacks up against SEC competition. Looks pretty good early. Former Texas Tech wide receiver saying, you know what? I can play on this stage. I've done it before. And a great ball. Great location by Shelton Epler. Yes. 
Epler set a school record for passing yards per game last year. He's thrown for 96 already tonight. This season, every field goal and extra point made by participating universities, Allstate will make a contribution to the university's general scholarship fund. Thank you, Allstate. All right, LSU's got to find a way to get back control of this game. And to me, that starts on the ground. Just eight rushing yards so far. We saw last week what Joe Burrow and this offense could do through the air, but in order to be successful tonight and down the road, this offense needs to start establishing some balance and needs to get Clyde Edwards-Alaire going. Daniel Justino will put it in the air for Northwestern State. Edward Zelaire back to receive. Edward Zelaire will bring it out. He's got a hole on the left side. And he bounces it to the outside before going back in. They'll take it out past the 30. That'll help. A bolt of energy. LSU. Had a 10-play drive on their first possession. They just came up short. Well, they had to settle for the field goal. Burrow pulls it back, completes it over the middle. Terrace Marshall, Jr., to midfield on a 20-yard strike in the first quarter. Will come to an end with LSU trailing Northwestern State, the fourth-ranked team in the country, surprisingly behind on their home field to the Demons. Western State with a lead on Ed Ogeron's LSU squad as we start the second quarter. Sun setting in the western sky on a beautiful night. to Saturday night in Death Valley. First first quarter points for Northwestern State that LSU has allowed all season. An LSU team that really got it going against Texas last week and offensively one of the top two offenses in the SEC. 80% of the yardage they got last week against Texas came through the air. Joe Burrow was in a zone. They were lighting it up, and that's really the effect of Joe Brady, the passing game coordinator now with LSU. That's what he's brought to this offense. Burrow going through his progressions, fires to the sideline, and a catch by Stephon Sullivan before he's drilled in the back after a gain of 16. A lot of mouths to feed in this offense, but it seems that there's plenty of footballs to go around. And we mentioned Stephon Sullivan is a big-bodied, athletic tight end. He creates mismatches, but that play right there, something I asked Joe Burrow about yesterday when we talked to him. Emphasis in the offseason, extending plays with his legs and making throws off-platform. Did both there. Burrow pulls it back over the middle. And no flag there. Marshall, the intended receiver, Dylan Wilson. The senior broke his wrist in the opener against AM last year and was out and comes with a big play here. He's really their best cover guy on the back end, missed a lot of football. So if anybody's anxious about making a big play tonight, it's Dylan Wilson and a great job breaking up that RPO, a little run pass option for the second time on this drive by LSU. Trying to work around a Sequoia, not easy. Second and 10. Burrow, comfortable in the pocket. Another strike to the edge. Terrace Marshall Jr. picks up 14. That's just a great job there by Burrow. Northwestern State brings a little pressure. It's picked up. Burrow was so good last year against the Blitz. This year, continuing in that direction. He's so calm, always sees things coming. It's really tough for a defense to pull one over on him. 
told us yesterday, so when I come to the line of scrimmage, I didn't know what we're going to do. Pump to the left, look back to the right. Extends with the legs and try to thread the needle there. He gets it complete to Marshall. They got him inside the 10. Wow, how did he catch that one in traffic? It goes for eight. They try a little pump and go. Remember the out route they completed on the other end of the field? They try the out and up. Didn't have it. And the ruling on the field is a catch. The previous play is under review. His feet were definitely in. Can't tell from that angle if the ball hits the ground, but it sure didn't look like it to me. Kent Switzer is a replay official. He'll take a look at it. Along with help from the video center of Birmingham. Look at this, line to game mm. camera right on it. Left foot definitely in. I think that's the only question because here's the angle right here. Control the catch through the ground. I yeah. got a catch. You got I do it too. Yeah, that right arm stays underneath the ball as he lands and rolls back over. So right foot in, right hand under the ball. Looks good to me. What a catch. Keeping that knee off the ground, that was crazy. After review, the ruling on the field is confirmed. It is a catch. What kind of confidence you think Joe Burrow has in this wide receiving court? <laughs> Supreme confidence in every single guy out there. I asked him yesterday, who's your favorite guy to throw to? He goes, I don't know. Just depends. <laughs> He's like, I really got confidence, honestly, in all these guys. And it didn't feel like a PC answer to me. You know, it didn't feel like he was just saying it because it's the right thing to say. I think he's truly confident in everybody out there. And already, Stefan Sullivan, I think, is climbing that list as well. Marshall, six catches. Career high against Texas. Of those six catches, five first downs and a touchdown. Burrow's going to take off. Looking to turn the corner. And it gets dragged down inside the five after gain of five. Ryan Reed with the tackle for the Demons. Trying to go inside zone, caught some movement up front from that Northwestern State defensive line. Tempo, Edwards Hilaire dances to the outside and into the end zone. It's a four yard touchdown run for Clyde Edwards Hilaire. The best backs you've ever watched and it reminds me maybe just because the height of a Barry Sanders that jump cut Whoop. hey see ya that's something you either got in the bag or you don't he's got it Cade York pounds it through LSU reclaims the lead on Northwestern State Clyde Edwards Hilaire the junior from right here in Baton Rouge at a Catholic high and the Tigers are up by three Let's take a look at Fansville, brought to you by Dr. Pepper. All right. Everybody's excited after the win against Texas. Some more than others. Yes, some more than others. Dan Epler for Northwestern State has started this game 9 of 12 for 96 yards. There we go, baby. There we go. This is what happened last time they had the football. He's done a great job of mixing things up, attacking the middle of the field when it's there, getting the ball quickly out of Shelton Epler's hands. They've worked every area of this field from sideline to sideline, and I love the tempo. 
And the formations that Brad Smiley, the offensive coordinator, is getting them in and out of. But another long, sustained drive here would go a long way. That'll count as a pass and a sweep to Miles Ward, and he got depleted. Damone Clark in Michael Divinity's spot, angling for more playing time. He's one of the guys they're trying out on the edge. He's been a, a stack inside linebacker, but showing the speed. And Oregon mm. Fellows, he's a legit 4'6 guy. Yeah. At 240. Last I checked, that's uh that's good. First career start against Georgia Southern. Had nine tackles playing in Divinity spot then too. On a second and eight. Man coverage on the outside, a little back shoulder toss, and they say incomplete to Akile Davis. Davis had a career high six catches against UT Martin. In that game, Shelton Epler completed 43 of 62 passes. He threw nearly 40 passes in the first half alone. He directed the offense at Trinity Valley Community College two years ago under Brad Smiley that led all of football in yardage through the air. On third down, great jump up front for LSU. Epler can only sling it to the bench. Patrick Queen came into the backfield to chase him out. Here's Dave Aranda mixing things up, trying to find a way to apply pressure there. A five-man rush this time, already early. And LSU hasn't been able to get to Shelton Epler with just a traditional four-man rush. So Aranda's going to continue to mix it up, especially on third down. Parker Passarello to punt it away. Derek Stingley Jr. stands at his own 30. Takes a Northwestern State hop. Stingley will corral it. And we got a flag back at the 33-yard line. 45-yard punt, 18 on the return from Stingley. Receiving team number 11. 10-yard penalty from the spot of the foul. First down. That'll back up Joe Burrow and company. And when we return, we'll tell you the secret to his success, what he does down the field between the numbers right after this. This new look LSU offense is thriving on the middle of the field. This is a drive concept, a five-yard shallow cross, a dig behind it. We're going to put the Mike linebacker in conflict. That's one guy that Burrow reads. He drives on the short route, opens up a big hole in the middle of the field for the dig. And this is a concept, Tom, that you will see a million different ways. The shallow, the dig might come from the same side. They might kind of come from opposite sides. But it gives Burrow an easy option for a second, third, or fourth read right over the middle of the field. He was perfect against Texas down the field between the numbers. And he's going right there again. And that's complete to Justin Jefferson. And he picks up a first down thanks to a 21-yard gain. I mean, let those numbers sink in. From 10 to 25 yards between the numbers all of last year, 13 games. Burrow had 28 of those. Last week, 10. And as many touchdowns as he did all of last year, that's the wrinkle that Joe Brady has brought to this LSU offense. And that's the reason he's completing a higher percentage of his balls. And this offense is being more productive and efficient. Over the middle again. Between the numbers again. This time it's Derek Dillon. Talking with Joe Burrow yesterday. He said the offense last year, play action, turn your back to the line of scrimmage, try to find a limited number of receivers. That wasn't me. That's not what I'm good at. And I wasn't comfortable in it. This is something he's been running basically since high school. It's exactly what he ran in high school. And what he's so good at is eye control, anticipation, and he's super accurate when he sees the spacing of the field. And this offense is allowing him to do just that. No longer is he turning his back with two or three man, usually two man combinations. Now if nothing's there, 
He can look defenders off, come back to easier throws to keep the offense moving in the right direction. This was Derek Dillon on the receiving end. Look just at the shy eyes. of the first down. See the eyes downfield, downfield, out to the outlet. And now Leonard Fournette takes it ahead for a first down in his first carry, and he bangs out eight. Good feel for this drive, a good tempo. It's not urgent, but it's brisk. Fournette again. Four yards that time. I'm sure Joe Brady and Steve Ensminger would love to establish the run, even though they've had plenty of success through the air. They're going to have to find balance. It's great when you can throw the ball all over the yard, but in the red zone and in big games, balance is crucial. Mm. Missed the Simon up front. Cole, what happened? We got a couple new edge defenders in the game, Tom, and obviously they're excited to try to rush the passer. They're trying to get upfield, but we've seen a lot of pass plays from Joe Burrow tonight, and obviously they continue to come up. You try to run a quick toss to that side. Offensive tackle doesn't get a reach block, doesn't get his hat across. It's going to go for a no game. Sadiq Charles not available tonight for LSU. Lloyd Cushenberry, the center. The anchor of the line now. Third down, 12. Burrow, aiming in zone. It gets through and into the hands of Terrace Marshall. A 14-yard strike. Is that who he was throwing to? I don't know. For a second, it looked like he was looking for number 10, Stephon Sullivan, up the middle of the field. Yeah, Sullivan's feet failed him. He was stumbling, and it ends up going to Marshall. And Burrow went immediately to Marshall almost to, I don't know, clear things up. But well, he, Talking with him, and as you lay out the levels concept, what I love about what LSU does is when he needs to go to his progressions, they're all right there in front of his face. And that makes a quarterback so comfortable. You see this. He's looking at Sullivan. Look at that. But, hey, when you're lucky, I'm good with that, too. You're watching SEC Saturday Night. Back at Death Valley in Baton Rouge. 8.50 to go before the half, and LSU has opened up a 10-point advantage on Northwestern State after the Demons had a 7-3 lead in this one. No chance for a return. Take a look at this touchdown again, because Burrow is trying to work to tear it, or excuse me, to uh, Stephon Sullivan here. He's got the opportunity to go over or under this defender. He goes under, stumbles a little bit, and that's when Marshall on the backside comes wide, not wide open, but he is open, but Burrow is looking down the middle, leads him a little bit, the timing's thrown off, and hey, Marshall's in the right place at the right time. Yeah, they got playmakers. You know, everybody talks about this Offense finally coming into modern times, but also LSU with wide receivers that can make plays that they can get the ball to. That are more mature and more confident this year. Stanford Anderson gets dragged down from behind. We've got a flag on the play. I'm Braden Fajoko, the senior from Honolulu. Elsewhere in the SEC, Kentucky leads Florida at the half for the first time since 2003. Personal foul. Horse collar tackle. From the That's the thing, it doesn't have to be all the way in the pads. It can be right on that name across the back. We saw that called in our game last week as yep. well. There's two backs. That was a great play. Great play by Fihoko getting upfield. 
and really, I mean, how big is he? 290? He's got some twitch, man. That's scary. That's a player that if he starts to be consistent, he can be a game wrecker in the backfield. First and 10 for Shelton Epler and Northwestern State. Anderson, the junior out of Baton Rouge, is his running back. They've got a dozen players in Baton Rouge area on this Northwestern State roster. Nearly intercepted. Monday at 7 Central, 7 Eastern, 6 Central. Thinking Out Loud is back. Another season with GMAC and Marcus. Break down the weekend on the gridiron. Talk about the hottest topics for the upcoming week right here on the SEC Network. That one's complete. Well, Dave Aranda's trying to figure out his defense, and he told us earlier that all the plans he had in the offseason kind of went by the wayside as they try to figure out who they are. And so in honor of Aranda, let's reference the Greek philosopher Heraclitus. No man ever steps into the same river twice, meaning who he thought this defense was. It might be some of the same players, but they're different now. They're different because there's different people around them. Aranda is a thinking man's coordinator. And so he's been hard at work trying to figure out how do we get pressure on opposing quarterbacks? What do we need to do to be successful, not on this Saturday night, but in the SEC? On third and four, complete. And that is good for the first down. Tom, I thought it was interesting how Dave Aranda told us, you can't be 1989 anymore. And I, I kind of asked him, like, why the year? Why that? He said, 1989, you pretty much went out, you played base defense. If you were better than the other guys, you ended up winning the game. Or your side of the ball won the football game. I said, you can't be that anymore. I thought it was going to be an Andre Ware reference and start talking about defending the run and shoot. And without key players up front and at linebacker tonight, but still doesn't stop the mission of improving this defense. Over the middle, that's complete. And bouncing off dudes and running for a first down. Northwestern State able to go to the tight end for a gain of 17. And part of that evolution, I mean, traditionally at LSU, you can say we got better athletes, we're going to man you up on the outside, we're going to play single high, and we're going to be better than you. But it's not that LSU is lacking as much as, in this day and age, spread offenses, RPOs, you have to have other ways to defend against that. You can't just play man coverage. There's too many ways the offense has an advantage. They go back to Anderson and he picks up seven. So what is the strength of this LSU defense right now? I still think it's in the, the playmaking ability on the back end with Delpit, Fulton, Stingley. So they have the ability to go man. But there's going to be a couple teams down the road with three, four wide receivers that are dynamic. You add tempo, you add RPOs. At some point, you can only cover guys so long. Pretty big one playing in Tuscaloosa right now in terms of dynamic wide receivers. They go there on November 9th. And that is a game that will likely determine the season for LSU. They only have three on the line of scrimmage. Everybody else back in coverage. Epler fires wide open. Touchdown, David Fitzwater. A 26-yard touchdown pass. Complete breakdown of coverage here. Man, not sure exactly what happened on the outside there, but there was some miscommunication. Just a double move. Man, Northwestern State answering the bell, Tom. Brad Laird told us, she said, we're going to have to be able to run the ball over the course of this season. But they didn't think they're going to be able to run it tonight. And through the air, they've got it done. Here's Scotty Roblo. Freshman from Shreveport for the point after. Northwestern State hanging right there. This is interesting to say the least. Shelton Epler's thrown for a couple touchdowns tonight. This time he's able to find a wide open David Fitzwater. It's a 17 to 14 lead with the Demons hanging around on a Saturday night in Death Valley. that guy man to man I would just give us options like if, if this is this is what I'm seeing they could be this
All right, Jari, thank you. What a boost of confidence for this Northwestern State team to be hanging in here with LSU. And the Tigers have had some key players defensively, but making plenty of mistakes defensively. Let's take another look at that touchdown pass and the busted coverage for the Tigers. A couple things could have happened here. So for one, this could be some form of cover four to this side where each deep player has a quarter, and that would mean the linebacker has the flats. But as you see this roll, it looks like the corner is supposed to be man, man, and a bracket coverage on that inside guy. So they're going to sort that out on the sideline, but obviously linebacker, cornerback miscommunication of whether that was zone or man, let that slot receiver run completely by everybody. It was Stingley and Trevez Moore on that side. Joe Burrow back to work. And a first down catch by Justin Jefferson. Points of reference last week against Midwestern State, a Division II team. Northwestern State had seven points and 243 yards the entire game. Tonight already two touchdowns and a buck 88 in just the second quarter. I'd watch for a shot play here. Burrow pulls it back. They almost got him. Rolls out and completes it to Stephon Sullivan. Gain of 19. This is such a good job by Joe Burrow. They're trying to take a shot deep with two receivers to the right. Doesn't like what he sees, so escapes. Oh. And he's finding some chemistry with St Stephon Sullivan outside the pocket on the scramble drill. That's a couple times they've hooked up on that. Long throw from Burrow that time, all the way out to Dre Jenkins. It's a gain of seven. Burrow spreading it around now. He's 15 of 16 on second and three. Straight ahead. Clyde Edwards Elair inside the five. Great push up front by the offensive line on that left side, blowing a huge hole in LSU with the tempo. Fifth play of the drive. Elair bottled up. No gain. Nicholas Ford in on the stop from Northwestern State. And this is where they've struggled getting push. They've done a good job at times with tempo, spreading receivers out of getting push on a lighter box. But down in the low red zone, as the defense adds to that box, they've struggled getting consistent push. To the ground game again. And Elair is in for the second time tonight. And it wasn't perfect there. But Edward, Edward Delaire does a great job of getting skinny and finding that hole, which you got to do down in the low red zone. Great run. Tigers perfect in the red zone this season. Cade York adds the point after. 10-point lead for Ed Ogeron's squad. A little tall up front there. You'd like a little lower push by the offensive line, but again, great job of finding the hole, getting skinny, and falling over your pads. Lloyd Cushenberry, Adrian McGee, center and left guard, doing a nice job climbing to the second level on that touchdown run. And Badara Treor in at left tackle for Sadiq Charles. He was being held out of this game by Ed Ogeron. He was suspended first game of the season as well. Three twenty-seven to go in the half. If Northwestern State can score again, they'll be partying on Front Street early. Hey, have you 
you see Marty? So Sheldon Epler, 14 of 20 for 152 and two touchdowns tonight. Previous meetings, Northwestern State had never scored a touchdown against LSU. And they've got one in each quarter so far this evening. We've seen a little more zone, a little more too high early from Dave Aranda. Wouldn't be surprised if he starts manning up a little bit more on the outside as we see one safety high here. I Meaning it's probably man across the board. Close off some of those windows that Epler's been able to find. Epler finds his tight end Fitzwater again. He's the one that had the touchdown catch on busted coverage on the last possession. That's a good play call. They've been holding that fake. That outside zone's been working off that earlier. Again, can't give Brad Smiley enough credit, the opposite coordinator for Northwestern State, in his game plan so far, spreading things wide, misdirection, getting the ball out of Epler's hands quickly. For 11 seasons, Smiley was the head coach at Trinity Valley Community College. Cardinals led all of football and offense a couple of years ago. Three yards that time. Stafford Anderson and Jared West have shared the uh, running back duties tonight. Second down seven. Epler, sidearms that one complete. Coming up at halftime, you can watch the live performance of the Golden Band from Tigerland over on SEC Network Plus. Start streaming now on the ESPN app. Good plumes. Is that what they're called? Sure. You looked that up. You didn't know that. One time at band camp. <laughs> Third down, a long two. Northwestern State draws a flag, or did they get a timeout? We got a flag dropped on the far sideline. Sideline warning against Northwestern State. That is their first warning of the game. It was one of the guys who signals in the plays on the far sideline who was running up the sideline to try and get in Epler's eyesight to throw in a late play change and Brad Laird saying stay back can't afford mistakes third down two Epler pressured setting up a screen on the back side and incomplete they leak Fitzwater out and it was batted away by Jacob Phillips, who wasn't fooled. I like the play design. Another misdirection. We saw a completion to start this drive on a misdirection to the tight end. This time, a throwback. That's a great ball. Put a little air on it. But Jacob Phillips, one of the best linebackers in the country in coverage last year, showing why he was a five-star prospect. Not only can he come up and hit you, He's like a nickelback in coverage. Fifth possession and just a second punt for Northwestern State in the first half. That should tell you all you need to know. It'll trickle to the 15 where it's knocked down by Northwestern State. A 37-yard punt that time for the senior from Mandeville High School, Parker Pastorello. So Joe Burrow... The offense will take the ball at the spot of illegal touching the 15-yard line, first down. Back on the field, he's got two great offensive minds in the box above him, Steve Ensminger and 29-year-old Joe Brady. Brady came to LSU from the Saints. He brought a brand-new offense with him. And it seems to be a perfect fit for Burrow, who is 15 for 16 in this one. Intercepted! 
Northwestern State with the pick by Dylan Wilson. And the Demons, with under a minute to go in the first half, have a chance to add some points. And this here, really the first mistake that we've seen from Joe Burrow all season. Interception last week was tipped. This one, he just stares down. Dylan Wilson is reading Joe Burrow's eyes, playing outside leverage there, watching the flats, but just read the eyes of Joe Burrow the entire way, trying to hit a corner out to Justin Jefferson. And it's not a mistake he usually makes. All right, so Northwestern State has some chances. What do you go to here for Shelton Epler? Remember, only one timeout remaining. They had to burn two. Uh, you got two guys to watch. Quan Shorts, number one, and Akile Davis, number nine, 6'2". Wouldn't be surprised if they find a mismatch for Davis at some point. On the previous play, the ruling on the field is an interception. That play is under review. Huh. What are we looking at? If he caught it clean initially, or I'm not sure. He's gonna go look in his tiny television. <laughs> I was looking at the turnover trident. Sorry. <laughs> Let's see. Clean. Uh, it's 110 percent in interception. If they want to change where he was from a yardage yeah, standpoint, yeah. that might be key. Spot. Foot goes out of bounds. Maybe a little before. Left foot there, yeah. Yep. That should be, that got to about the 19. After review, video evidence shows that the runner did intercept the ball. However, he stepped out at the 17 and one half yard line. The ball will be respotted to the 17 and a half. First down. Does that change anything for Northwestern State when it comes to play calling? Uh, nope. You would have asked this entire team how do you feel about 24-14 with 58 seconds left in the first half at LSU? Should we take a few shots? I'd say yes. Keely Davis down here at the bottom, their biggest wide receiver. And Quan Shorts in the slot. He'll find a band member. You know, it's interesting. Brad Smiley mentioned a lot of times they'll have split field reads. So a zone side and a man side. A lot of times they'll put Quan Shorts to the man side. But if I'm in the red zone, I'm looking for matchups. I want to find my playmaker and I want to get him the ball. You got man coverage across the board here, one high. Shorts matched up with Kerry Vincent Jr. in the slot. LSU shows edge pressure. Play clock winding down. Here they come. End zone shot. It is knocked away at the last second by Derek Stingley Jr. Dave Aranda told us when Stingley showed up for bowl practice last year, essentially as a high school senior, he was the best cornerback on the team. Mind you, that included Greedy Williams. He's that talented. I mean, ball skills, instincts. He's going to be special, and already is. But again, why is the ball not going to Quan Shorts? Right here in the slot, the three receiver side. Got Vincent on him again, third and ten. Epler fires, Shorts through the hands and incomplete. That was a dart. That was on the money. This is a difficult catch for, for Quan Shorts to haul that in. But this is what they wanted. Epler puts this one on the money. And Kerry Vincent getting his hand up at the last minute there probably distracts the view for Shorts, and that's probably why he didn't haul that one in. 35-yard attempt for Scotty Roblo. Freshman from Shreveport, Shreveport Bird High School. Chip shot, missed it wide. Well, this Northwestern State program has a couple of big wins 
Perhaps the biggest in school history, 2001 in Fort Worth in Gary Patterson's first home game. They won 27 24 in overtime. They need to make plays like this if they want a chance for an upset tonight. Tell you what, if third and 17 was any indication last week, 35 seconds left, two touch, or excuse me, two timeouts, would not be surprised if we see something to the middle of the field here. Try to get some yards after catch. Flip field position here, getting field goal range or have one spit. Burrow looks over the middle, hangs a U-turn, and he will scramble out of bounds. Eight-yard run for Joe Burrow. He's got an LSU record five consecutive games with 20 completions or more. Two-thirds of the way there already, just in this first half, 15 of 17, with one touchdown and one pick. Burrow facing pressure gets it away over the middle of first down clock will stop for a moment 16 yards to Justin Jefferson and that's a great job of being patient by Joe Burrow he wanted to go in the first window waited for Jefferson get to the second window there so we could complete that Burrow dragged down from behind it's a loss of six O'Shea Jackson with the stat, uh, sack and LSU will take a timeout Second timeout. O'Shea Jackson able to get around Lloyd Cushenberry. Just came off that double team a little late. Jackson did a great job of turning the corner, getting low with leverage. They're happy to have him back. Wasn't out there week one of the season. Lost to UT Martin. They are 0-2 on this year. And there was an, another big upset in Northwestern State's athletic history. Men's basketball NCAA tournament. And Northwestern State as a 14 seed in 2006. Knocked off three seed Iowa. Jermaine Wallace hit a game winning three with a half second left. That was a come from behind win for the Demons that night. I never understood this here. Why not just throw a little screen? You know? No, there's not a, a good chance anything's going to go, but some, something easy, a little, little screen route. I'm with you. Let your athlete get in space and see what happens. We got a flag before the half ends. Looks like a personal foul penalty coming. Lee Hedrick, our referee. Both teams headed off the field. After the play was over, personal foul. Offense, number 79. It's one second on the clock. However, that, play, that penalty carries a 10-second runoff. So that's a personal foul. Lloyd Cushenberry. Frustrating LSU first half for LSU. The, 10 second runoff. the penalty will be enforced on the second half kickoff. And Ed Ogeron, a product of Northwestern State, headed towards the locker room with his crew, trying to figure out how can they can slow down Shane Shelton Epler. He's thrown for 172 and two touchdowns. Let's take it down the field. Cole standing by with Coach Ogeron. Coach Ogeron, what have you seen from this Northwestern State offense that's allowed them to have success in the first half? Yeah, yeah, a lot of quick throws, a lot of slants. Uh, we got to get tight enough covers, got to get our hands up. They came to play, but uh, we're going to focus on winning the game. Play for 60 minutes, win this football game. I feel good about winning it. A little sloppy there, sequence of events to, to end the half. What's your message going to be to your team at the halftime? Hey, you know, we got to play at the center of LSU football. That's all. We got to come back and play for 60 minutes. We're going to do that. I know we will. Thank you, Coach. Go Tigers. It's a 24 14 lead for LSU. They're getting all they can handle from Northwestern State. It's made it awfully interesting, but not as interesting as Chris Doring's pocket square. Here's Dory Chiz and Dory. Bless you after dark. College football's greatest spectacle.
This is the Death Valley. And these tigers prefer to hunt at night. Welcome back to SEC Saturday night. There is an opportunity in front of Northwestern State tonight. They trail the number four ranked team in the country by 10. Laird, in his time, was the most productive quarterback in school history. But the guy he has now, Shelton Epler, has a chance to bring them their biggest win in school history. He's already thrown for two touchdowns. And Ogeron trying to get the defense figured out. Meanwhile, his quarterback, Joe Burrow, has everything figured out offensively. 16 of 18 through the air. Welcome back, Tom Hart. Jordan Rodgers, how does last week's win at Texas relate to what's happening right now for LSU? I think it's big. I think it's a perfect storm. Obviously, a lot of guys out for LSU, so the guys that are playing aren't used to having to focus for full quarters, let alone a full game. And really, I think the message in the locker room, if I was Coach O, is this is not how we handle success. This is not how we handle hype. Because there was a lot of it after yeah. that Texas victory, so this team needs to refocus. Not really doing anything bad. Obviously, Epler has had a lot of success, and that defense needs to change schemes a little bit back to a little more man, I believe. But right now, if I'm LSU, establish the run. 46 rushing yards in the first half against Northwestern State. That's not a championship-level balance or run game in my mind. Let's go down to the sidelines. Cole, what did you hear from head coach Brad Laird of Northwestern? Oh, I asked him defensively. On the play to end the first half, the personal <laughs> foul would have been enforced. <laughs> then the 10-second runoff occurs, and the penalty is enforced on the, in the first half. There is no carryover of the penalty for the personal foul to the second half kickoff. Uh, take two. <laughs> uh, Brad Laird told me at the half, he said defensively, we didn't bring a ton of pressure in that half, didn't feel like we needed to, but we probably will add more in the second half. I asked him offensively, I said, was there a matchup or a look that you liked that led to the success that you have? He said, not really. He said, it was the rhythm. He said, when this offense gets into a rhythm, they get comfortable, they settle down, and they play faster. They're going to try to play that fast again in the second half. Is it a good idea, in your opinion, to bring more pressure to Joe Burrow? I was really surprised in the first half, Tom, that they sat back as much as they did because they are a pressure-based defense. So a lot of three-man for us, and when they brought pressure, it would just be to get back to four rushers. So I don't know if it's a great idea, but we have seen some breakdowns with blitz packages from this LSU offensive line the first two weeks of the season. LSU will receive this kick to start the second half. They have won 30 consecutive games against in-state foes, dating back to a 1982 matchup with a green wave of Tulane. Clyde Edwards-Alaire takes it out, and we've got a uh, return out to the 26-yard line. So Joe Burrow, 16 of 18 for 231, a touchdown, and one mistake, the pick. What do you think of his play? I think he's picked up right where he left off last week. We're seeing LSU hammer the middle of the field, which is going to be a staple of this team moving forward. Like to see him take a few more shots, obviously. But to me, they got to run the football. Have to run the football. This has got to be a game where LSU can exert its will over this Northwestern undersized defensive front. Only 46 yards on the ground in the first half for LSU. Burrow on play action. Takes it over the middle. And a crossing route complete for a first down. Plenty of room to run. And LSU will take it all the way into Demon territory. 47 yards for Justin Jefferson. Love it. Love it. I mean, everybody on the field is thinking like me. They're going to come out. They're going to start to run the football, slow this game down, play action, hit a big one over the middle of the field again, and allow your receiver to get some yards after the catch. Edwards Hilaire empties out of the backfield. Burrow over the middle. Work in the middle again, and it's Terrace Marshall. A gain of 12. Nice byproduct of that running back motion right there. You saw outside linebacker had to run with him. That created easy space over the middle. Hilaire with a spin move. Now trying to stretch. And he takes it to the five-yard line. An extra few yards with Demons converging. Turns it into an eight-yard gain. He's fun to watch. The lateral quickness, the jump cuts. Look at this, nothing there. Spin move, 
get outside. And I love this. Don't run for the sideline. Turn it back in. Try to get some extra yards. Dylan Wilson is the injured player for Northwestern State. Will step away for a timeout here in the second half from Baton Rouge. Saturdays in the South is our eight-part documentary that chronicles the history of SEC football. Tuesday at 9 Eastern, 8 Central. Part 3 explores the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Bear, Archie, Richmond Flowers Jr., and George Wallace. You can only see Saturdays in the South right here on the SEC Network in the ESPN app. The episode last week was fantastic. Talked about the great championship teams of LSU, including Billy Cannon's punt return against Ole Miss on Halloween night. Second and two for Joe Burrow and LSU. Burrow keeps it. Dives into the end zone. A touchdown run for the gunslinger, Joe Burrow. That's just a good read. Zone read here. Powell Moore, number 35, crashes on the running back, and there is absolutely nobody home. Oh, Joe Burrow has been so impressive with his arm early in this season. We forget he can make plays with his legs, too. That doesn't need to be what he primarily does, but he is so dangerous in situations like these because you have to account for it. That Jimmy watching from the stands. Longtime defensive coordinator. He was with Frank Solich at... Ohio University until last year. He didn't coach, coach Joe much, but he coached him one time in youth league basketball. And Joe kept firing up threes. And when Jimmy called him to the side and said, you need to run the offense, Joe said, no, no. I'm a shooter. Shooters shoot, Dad. They want to take a look and see if the knee or the leg was down before the ball crossed the plane. All it's got to do is touch the first part of that white, and it looks like it definitely does there. Shoot or shoot, you know? I mean, is that not what we saw last week from Joe Burrow? Are you kidding me? He was throwing them up from beyond the arc every chance LSU got, and it paid off big. They've had some great basketball players in their family as they confirm the call. His grandma, Dot Ford, scored 82 points for Smithville High School in a Mississippi high school game. That extra point is pushed right. That's right, 82. What? 82? For grandma, Dot. Anybody else score in that They've game? They've had shooters shooting for a long time wow. in this family. Grandmama. <laughs> That's right. It's probably 12-minute quarters, too. It's a quick game to score 82. We asked Joe yesterday, though, guys, how do you feel about running the football? He said, I love it. I want to do it. Give it to me. And if you watched LSU play last year, he essentially was their short yardage back. So he can be a valuable commodity in short yardage goal line situations. Point after miss for Cade York. In LSU, the 16-point lead. They've only run for 59 yards tonight. Here's a drive summary. Looking about Russell Marcus, the official supermarket. LSU Athletics. Tigers with seven. They're going to try to bring this one out. And it won't have a great result out to the 17-yard line. Extra yard for Teachers Week is an annual celebration led by the College Football Playoff Foundation that honors great teachers across the country. To learn more about Extra Yard for Teachers, follow it CFP Extra Yard or search the hashtag Extra Yard Week. T. Paul Pierce was Ed Ogeron's favorite teacher at LCL Middle School. He said, I still remember the game that we won against LaRose Middle. He said, there wasn't a bigger win in my life. And I told the guys that after the win against Texas, I still remember that 14-7 final 
back in middle school. It's go Tigers now as go Bulldogs in. Almost picked. He was off the hands of Christian Fulton. Almost the exact same type of play that Joe Burrow threw the interception on. He's reading eyes the whole way here, sitting in coverage. Man, that would have been six. Another guy, Mel Kuyper, had Christian Fulton number 21 on his big board for the 2020 draft next year. A lot of hype, a lot of expectation around this secondary with Grant Delpit as well. Kuyper had him 21. McShay had him number 10 on yeah. his preseason board. Let that rivalry continue. Second and 10. They take it out to the 20-yard line on a completion to Keele Davis. That's another thing, though. You, you look at the talent they have on the back end. Obviously, Derek Stingley's a true freshman. It's going to be a while before, maybe a couple years before he starts thinking about the draft. But Grant Delpit, Christian Fulton, ton of expectations. How do you handle your money season, right? That's the a season great that you're supposed to lock in a top 10 pick or a first round draft pick to set yourself up for life. You're supposed to perform, but along with that comes a lot of added pressure. Long season, but already both those guys not starting out to the expectation they hold themselves to. On third and five, Stingley had a hand on it. Almost took it away. We talked to Ed Ogeron about that yesterday. When can you identify guys that may have issues? You said you can see it. From day one of the junior season, he got to nip it in the bud early. This guy's going to have a great career. Oh, the instincts. That's a quick slant. The ball is not in Shelton Epler's hands very long. But Stingley read it, broke on it. That's two in a row they should have had. Epler lucky to escape. Tell you what, though, he's sitting back there waiting to get this punt. And he's like, all right, I'll make up for it. Should have had one there. Watch him on this punt return if he gets an opportunity. He'll have a chance. Stingley from the 42. First guy misses. Second one misses. Third one's blocked to the 40. He takes him down inside the 35-yard line. The punter got him. Parker Pastorello, 38-yard punt. And after a 26-yard return, credit the punter with the tackle. But first, what can Burrow do with this third and long? of us handing the ball off, running some 40 seconds down, relying on our defense to make stops, like just to see them be more aggressive. Um, it's exciting to watch. Looking at it and seeing the changes that they made, it's almost like this is what we've been waiting on. Right, like, right. You know, like we wish kind of we were in that offense. Could you imagine those dudes in this offense? OBJ is on Monday Night Football with Booger on the call, by the way. They got the Jets. And don't forget NFL primetime. Boomer and TJ are back Sunday nights at 7.30 Eastern only on ESPN Plus. To get it, download the app or go to ESPNPlus.com. I like they're taking a shot here. I think they're going to attack this safety with two guys going vertical. Burrow going that way. Incomplete. Terrace Marshall Jr., the intended receiver. Dylan Wilson was banged up earlier this half. He was in there on the coverage. They did have two verticals, one on each side of the field. Burrow liked his leverage to the right side better and just maybe four or five inches out in front there might have had a chance. That's a tight coverage, tough throw. Clyde edwards Elair, physical run, and he gets tossed down after a gain of eight. So Burrow has missed a total of three times tonight. He's 18 of 21. <laughs> with a touchdown and one interception. Burrow has run for a touchdown. Now he runs for a first down. One byproduct of this game remaining close through a half plus is that Steve Ensminger has not been able to get extended work for his freshman running backs like Chris Curry, Tyrion Davis-Price, and John Emery Jr. And they got a lot of work in practice this week. Those are guys they want to get going. They know they're going to need them down the season, especially in conference. So valuable reps here for those young guys. Burrow pulls it back. 
And on a rollout, he's got all day. Day and a half. And he finally steps out of bounds. Eight-yard run by Joe Burrow, the yeah. dancing bear. Yeah, they wanted Justin Jefferson a little angle route to the middle of the field. He got locked up. And oh, <laughs> those are fun. I used to love those. That'll get you hyped up more than throwing like a 50-yard bomb, just making someone go. Whoop. I don't know if I believe that. Here's second and two. And they're held short, so it'll be third and a short run, a short one for LSU. See, here's my problem with this right here, and Jordan made good points about running the football. You can't be selectively committed to running the football. Elair picks up the first down. Expound on that, Cole. If you're going to be a gun team, you're going to throw the ball 40, 45 times a game. It can't come down to a game where, oh, now we have to be a team that runs the football. Or now we're inside the red zone. Or now we're on the three-yard line. We need to be a team that can go out and play ground and pound and run the football and force it between the tackles because that's not who you are. And who you are is what you work and practice every day. So if you don't rep it, you don't practice it, you don't work it as much as you do everything else that makes you who you are, then selectively you can't just commit to it in certain points of a game or certain points of a season. Well, I think one of the main concerns for LSU is how to get to be a championship program. And number one is to beat LSU. And the, uh, pardon me, to beat Alabama. And the offense has been non-existent the last three seasons head-to-head -head with Alabama. Yeah, and especially throwing the football. I mean, if you just look, look back last year, and I, I was one pointing out that against good defenses, they were absent. They couldn't throw the football. They couldn't be effective or dynamic pushing the ball downfield. Burrow last year went on a span of four straight SEC games against good opponents where they didn't throw a touchdown. Now, this offense is going to be different. It's going to set him up to have success in those situations, but you still got to be able to run the football especially in the SEC, in this conference. And Cole's right. You can't pick and choose. It's a mentality. You don't just turn it on and off. Tom, you said against Alabama the last three seasons. Do you guys have any idea who the last LSU quarterback was to throw for 300 yards against the Crimson Tide? I'd love to hear it. Matt Flynn, 2007. 353 yards against the Crimson Tide in a win. Well, in terms of where this offense wants to be, where they thought they were when they hired Matt Canada, in the last, well, since 2008, they've thrown for 164 Three games under 100. That's just not getting it done. I mean, every year, seemingly, that next step for LSU has been not successful because they haven't had a quarterback that can really take them there. They have that now. But even as good as it looks like Joe Burrow in this offense is going to be this season, there will be times that they have to be balanced. Sullivan, the man in motion. Plenty of time on the play clock after the injury. Demons drop back. Burrow trying to thread the needle. And he does it again. Terrace Marshall for the second time tonight. These are the types of throws that Joe Burrow didn't have in his arsenal last year. And he admitted it yesterday when we talked to him. He's like, look, I focused on my lower body. I focused on creating more velocity with my throws, throwing off platform better. You saw it in third and 17 against Texas, off platform, barely two feet on the ground, delivered a strike 20, 25 yards downfield, and that one off platform, sprinting to your left has the arm strength to deliver that. LSU missed their last point after. Cade York would try to perfect that. And the lower body strength and the core strength that he's worked on to able to have the ability to finish those throws like he did on the third and 17 against Texas. LSU has found its rhythm. They've opened up a 37 to 14 advantage against Northwestern State. Let's take a look at the road to the championship brought to you by Mercedes-Benz. Got to go through Tuscaloosa to get to Atlanta. The last three matchups have not been favorable for LSU in an offensive standpoint. They've outscored 63 to 10. They've been shut out twice.
This offense is going to be different this year. It absolutely will be. It's night and day from what it was last year, a year ago, when they got blanked by Alabama. They have found something special in the tempo, in the condensed formations. In Joe Brady. In, in Joe Brady, in Joe Burrow. Yes. And what this offense is allowing him to do with the strengths he already had. It's fun to watch. It really is. Brady was working with Breeze in the Saints last year. His background goes back to Joe Moorhead in their time at Penn State. Tough loss for Mississippi State today. Brady in the middle of the screen. Next to offensive coordinator on the far right, Steve Ensminger. S. Ensminger, you know, what was it like when you were running the offense here at LSU? He goes, man, it was real simple. I'd turn around and I'd hand it to Charles Alexander. And if we got to third and long, then maybe I get a chance to throw the ball. Nothing doing for Jared West. Fajoko, another stop. Reminder, Rashard Lawrence, Glenn Logan, Justin Thomas, Caleb on chase on. All being held out of this game for LSU. Three chase on Lawrence and Logan to rest for injury and Thomas coach's decision. Fajoko has made some plays tonight. With, with Rashard Lawrence out, Glenn Logan out, he's had big opportunities. He's capitalized on it. Epler, incomplete. Cole, what difference does Caleb on chase on make in the scope of this defense? Gigantic difference. You know, you, we think offensively when we think about teams becoming too reliant on certain football players, like we say, oh, what would Bama be without Tua? What, what would Florida be without Felipe Franks? I think this defense is totally different when Caleb on chase on is on the field. He adds a dimension of speed, power, athleticism, and he impacts the pocket in multiple ways. I don't think they have another guy like him, and we have seen a lack of pass rush here tonight. See if they get after Epler here on third and long. Epler flush from the pocket. Will try to run. Can't quite turn the corner. Lost the football on his way down. They'll say he was down after a gain of four. Damone Clark, sophomore out of Southern Lab here in Baton Rouge, tracked him down from his linebacker spot. Another guy capitalizing on the absence of a Michael Divinity on the inside. He's played well sideline to sideline. Haven't seen him rush the passer as much as we thought we might. That's been more Ray Thornton. But he's played well in that interior linebacker position. That's a big stop right there. I mean, it, I know it's 37-14, but LSU was physical up front on that, on that short drive. And, Good punt. Taken at the 21-yard line. When we return, we're going to tell you how a former major league pitcher helped Joe Burrow develop his arm strength and turn into the quarterback he is today. Joe Burrow and the LSU offense has settled into a rhythm here in the second half. Overall, he's 19 of 22. He's on the verge of his fourth 300-yard passing game having thrown for 298 thus far. And he's doing it with a depleted core, missing a starting right receiver and a starting tight end. He's got John Emery Jr. in the backfield now. And Burrow lobs it downfield, complete for a first down. And a foot race now for John Trey Kirkland. Kirkland races all the way down for a 65-yard gain. been impressed with the arm strength that Joe Burrow has displayed this year compared to last year but here this is touch and this is something you either have or you don't have Burrow has the ability to manipulate the trajectory on his balls and an accurate touch pass there for a big play Emory's first touch brings him nothing so tell me how Tom House helped Joe Burrow if you've heard the name Tom House it's probably not because of his baseball past as you mentioned Tom it's probably because he's worked with Tom Brady Drew Brees and a slew of other NFL quarterbacks on really improving their lower body strength mechanics which increases your velocity takes pressure off your shoulder it's elongated the careers of Brees and Brady as both those guys have held their arm strength or maintained it into their 40s Pretty impressive the stuff he's doing out in Southern California with quarterbacks. 
Burroughs completes it to the edge. Staying on his feet and turning more yardage is Kirkland again. It's a gain of 11. And so I got a chance to see Burrow this summer at the Manning Passing Academy in warm-ups, kind of doing something with his lower body. So he's going to preset his left foot there. He's going to really focus on getting his back hip through the throw. And John Emery takes it in from four yards out. The freshman from St. Rose at Adestrahan High School. And that's his first touchdown. They finish it off with a run, but that drive was on the arm of Joe Burrow. And you saw there what he's doing with his lower body. It's called creating a disassociation. Your hips should go first, and then your upper body, because you've created torque, is going to come through like a golf swing, right? You get that club all the way up, your hips go first, create some torque, and it comes through. That takes pressure off your arm. It increases your velocity. And that's one thing in Joe Burrow's game I've noticed. He's driving the ball more consistently on a rope as well as driving it more consistently and accurately downfield with touch, as we saw earlier. A lot of that has been his focus on creating more velocity and power with his lower body. Cade York puts it through. Tom House was a pitcher in the major leagues from 71 to 78. You know who might be surprised by this? Urban Meyer. You talked about the touch, but also arm strength. Urban Meyer told him he threw like a girl. <laughs> That is so right. I was asking him about what he's worked on his arm. So he goes, you know what? Urban, you say he couldn't stand watching me throw. He's like, he don't have a good arm. And so Burrow kind of took it personally. And he just started trying to throw harder and throw harder. And what that did is it created a long release. His mechanics got all funky. So while he was still at Ohio State, him and JT Barrett went out to see Tom House to work on those mechanics. He's a lot tighter with his left arm when he throws. His lower body's better, and he's creating more velocity and arm strength without just trying to throw harder. That Ohio State connection certainly helped Joe Burrow, and Joe Brady was hired. First person he called was JT Barrett, who had been working with Brady with the Saints. Barrett sung Brady's praises, and Burrow thought, They'd be in pretty good hands. I'm not sure he had an idea that the offense would be this electric. No. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if anybody did. You know, watching film last year, as I mentioned earlier in the broadcast, there was blame to go all the way around. From Joe Burrow, the offensive line, the receivers, the scheme. So really, even that Georgia Southern game, I was still hesitant. You know, it, okay, it's lesser competition. What's really going to be different? How's it going to be different against good competition? And they showed that at Texas, that they're going to play call aggressively and allow Burrow to play quarterback. Go through three, four reads, not just turn his back for play action, try to huck it deep or throw two-man combinations and not put him in a situation to use what he does best. Beat the defense with his mind, look guys off, and use his accuracy. Joe Burrow, 21 to 24 for 373 and two touchdowns tonight. Still, not entirely happy with the offense. Coaching, that's what the best leaders do. Doesn't that remind you of a Tom Brady getting on guys even after a touchdown? There's a standard to which Joe Burrow holds himself and the rest of his team. And you can look up the scoreboard and you can say, oh, it's all gravy now. But just a win tonight, no matter the fashion, is not the goal of this team. The goal of this team is championships. And they're going to have a chance to do it because of this offense, because of the leadership and fire of Joe Burrow. His Heisman odds dramatically increased after yeah. the win against Texas. Northwestern State runs it with Stadford Anderson. Still a lot of starters out there for LSU, and you're going to notice Grant Delpit here in a single high and man coverage across the board. So Dave Aranda getting away from some of the zone they played earlier. More man coverage to slow down Shelton Epler in this offense that had a lot of success in the first half. Gain of one that time. Maybe it'll be it for Burrow. Miles Brennan is starting to get loose. Talking with offensive coordinator Steve Ensminger, he said, if we get Brandon into the game, I want to make sure he's able to have full control of the offense. And we will run the offense and get him those reps just as long as the head coach will let us. 44-14, to 14, I'm not sure he's going to have that luxury, but 
Hopefully we can see him toss it around a little bit. Incomplete, just a hair behind Davis. Second half has gotten a little out of hand, but if you remember, it was 24 14 and a half. Northwestern State had an opportunity to score before half after an interception. They played very admirably in the first half, and LSU is going to watch this film, especially on the defensive side in that first half, and figure out what their identity is going to be moving forward. Whether it's zone and bringing some more pressure to get after the quarterback. There's Stingley. To the 45. Or whether they're going to do what they've always done, go one high, lock up with man. And... Tough to get a read with the manpower that's not out there today also. It is. It totally is. This kid's special, man. And to reiterate what Dave Aranda told us, Stingley showed up fresh out of high school, got about 12 bowl practices in, wasn't allowed to travel with the team to the Fiesta Bowl and practice there. But as of then, with a future NFLer in the backfield, at least one, if not more, Dave Aranda said, if I was allowed to plug him in, I would have. And he would have been our best cornerback on that team. Tyrion Davis is in at running back. And Burrow completes this one to Jenkins. Parmy Brennan for a nine-yard gain. They told us he ripped Burrow in his first practice. Yes. He intercepted him, and he had a couple of key picks when we were at practice on Thursday. So Brennan getting a chance to run the offense. Sophomore from Long Beach, Mississippi. St. Stanislaus High School. And he hands it off to Davis Price for a gain of five. Brennan's a good player. You're going to notice a little more lively arm than Joe Burrow. He's got a lot of arm talent. And just like Burrow, he's more comfortable in this offense. Ran the spread, ran the RPO game a lot in high school. So both these quarterbacks benefiting from getting back in shotgun, keeping everything in front of them, and playing a little more wide open. Here's Davis Price. Baton Rouge native. Opportunities late in this one for guys who didn't get many touches against Texas. Tell you what, he gets downhill. Those first couple runs, he shot out of a cannon. He's getting his helmet on somebody as quick as possible. Brennan fires and completes another. And Troy Carter. As a first, first down for LSU, junior out of Lee County High School in Valdosta, Georgia. Don't see much of that anymore here at LSU. The days of old, running back, tight end, sometimes a fullback. They stayed in 11 personnel almost the entire game with Burrow in. And really that tight end, Stephon Sullivan, you, you could put a hash mark wide receiver next to that tight end position as well. 11 He's athletic. Yeah. 11 personnel signifying one running back, one tight end. One running back, one tight end. But with Sullivan's athleticism, obviously Thaddeus Moss is going to be back. He's a really good player as well. But Sullivan's athleticism, you can split him out. You can bring him inside. You don't have to go 10 personnel to get some of those looks and have the speed on the field that they want to when they're tempo and when they're throwing the rock around. O'Shea Jackson helped off the field. Big one tonight in the SEC East at Kroger Field in Lexington. And Kentucky leads Florida 21-16 of lasting importance for Florida. Felipe Franks left that game with a gruesome lower leg injury. He may be out for the year. He would be the third quarterback from the East to be lost for the year if that's the case. Joining Bentley at South Carolina and Wilson at Kentucky. That'd be a big bummer, too. Was really looking forward to seeing how Felipe Franks would continue to grow under Dan Mullen. Kyle Trask, a good quarterback, though. Brandon slings it. And here goes Davis Price. Finally, submarine at the 10 for a gain of 18. 
they are running the offense. They're not just handing the ball off. This is a double move. They're trying to hit a shot play downfield. But Miles Brennan, well beyond his years, at least in experience, it's a great job of checking the ball down for a big play. Davis Price over the goal line and in. 11-yard run. I'll tell you what, if you're an LSU fan and you're watching this right now, I want to see Davis Price get a lot more touches as this season progresses. He's fun to watch. Ball gets in his hand. He, he runs gets, angry. He, he does run angry. He gets downhill. Look at this. He's just trying to hit somebody. See where that elbow hits. That's going to be short. That's going to be about a half yard short there. The ruling on the field is a touchdown. That play is under review. Freshman John Emery already got one score tonight. Davis Price trying to match him. Elbow down, ball short of the goal line. Going to respot that one and uh, going to hand it right back to him. The only question is, this is where the spot's important. Is it inside the one and therefore a first down? Oh. Looks like it. Yeah. After review, video evidence shows that the runner was elbow was down prior to the ball breaking the plane of the goal line. The ball will be placed at the one yard line and the clock will start on my signal. I don't think it's a very good spot. It took a half yard away. I agree there. with you. The one. So it's second and inches instead of first and goal from inside the one. I thought that ball was clearly at the half yard line. Do we have half yard lines in football? What? Yes, of course you do. I don't Put that see ball where his elbow's down. And he was across that one yard line, but let's see if it matters. Well, Tom, I'm down here on the sideline, and I can confirm that we do not have half yard lines. Thank you. But he can now get it. Uh, First down? No. The result of the play will be first down from the one yard line. I was wondering. See, on that spot, it looks like a little short. We're all getting technical now. <laughs> yeah. Give me, give me some stripes. Actually, the one time I did it, I was absolutely terrible <laughs> at spotting the ball. So count me out. I take back what I said. Another chance. He didn't leave anything to doubt this time. His offensive line put dudes four yards into the end zone. And Davis Price has his first touchdown, finally. Good push there up front. Look at that. Every offensive lineman, one, two, three yards deep in the end zone. That's good to see. I know Cole loves that down there. Especially short yarders, we talked about the mentality. Is this who you are? Is this inside of your DNA? And I think that's part of it on film on the other end, as we talked about it in the second quarter. They were, they were playing high at the goal line. Pad level was too high, so something they'll look at at film. Well, it's, it's tough to get leverage in short yarded situations coming out of a two-point stance. And when you're in gun, you're in a two-point stance. And you're, just, you're not naturally low to the ground, so when you come off, you're going to come off a little bit high, and you have the better chance of losing leverage. Do they still use shoots? Absolutely. I don't know if you old linemen were getting too soft for those. I mean, I am, but... <laughs> I mean, just last night, I was playing shoots and ladders. That's what you're talking That's about, right? That's not what we're talking about. Candyland? That's a great game, but... Candygram? It's a friendly dolphin. 406 yards through the air for LSU. 500 yards of offense for the Tigers. Seems like there is still, I mean, I know you grade Joe Burrow against the expectations of a championship level right. quarterback. If you judge this LSU program as a whole to that degree, there are still concerns, specifically on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, specifically affecting the quarterback. And I was really surprised at how long we talked about this with Dave Aranda. His first goal was to win this game. His second was to establish a four-man rush. And his third was to establish and put on film 
more importantly, some exotic four-man, five-man pressures. I thought it was interesting he said that. I want to put that on film so people know we can do that. We don't just line up, rush four, and play man on the outside. I think there's still a lot of question marks with how they're going to affect the quarterback outside of Caleb on chase on when he's healthy. Speaking of Caleb on chase on, Cole will take us through his look and what makes Caleb on such a special defensive player. I believe he's the most valuable player on this defense. Flexibility, first and foremost. Watch him get off the edge. Watch how low he is to the ground when he bends the edge and he can affect the pocket. He forces an offensive tackle to have to defend that. And he can turn that speed into power. Watch the wingspan. Get the arm inside, completely bull rush the offensive tackle. And then the quickness and the speed. Be able to utilize him on stunts inside, not just one-on-ones, but three-man games as well. He can close on the quarterback in a hurry and he can be a problem for opposing offenses. Caleb on Chase John, not available to play tonight. But he does allow you and allows Dave Aranda to get a little creative. You can put him on one side. You can play some games or bring pressure or drop guys on the other side. And I talked to him before the game a little bit. I just said, hey, man, how you feeling? He said, oh, I'm 85, 90%. So I, I think he's very close. He, he's not somebody that, in my opinion, just watching him move around a little bit that LSU fans should be concerned about being out for the for the near future. Well, if you're wondering how a defensive coordinator comes up with ideas and how to develop his unit over the summer, it's simple. You go on vacation. Dave Aranda was at Watercolors, a little golf beach action, and uh, on the beach, he on his way there, called Manny Diaz, head coach at Miami. Want to talk through some things? Ball start. On the offense, number three, five-yard penalty, remains second down. Manny said, yeah, I got time to talk. Right now, I got the family in the car. We're driving to Watercolor. Dave said, I'm going there, too. And then once there, he ran into DJ Elliott at the corner store. <laughs> so every morning, while the wives were still asleep and the kids hadn't gotten up and going yet, the three dads, also great defensive minds, would get together and talk football on the beach. How cool is that? I think, I think fans sitting at home would be surprised to know just how much that does happen. Coaches, it's a brotherhood to some degree. You're not going to do it with guys you're going to play normally on the schedule, but if there's an outside chance at a bowl game down the road, then you're totally fine sitting down, talking scheme. How'd you stop this? What are you doing in this look? Ron Shorts takes that one out. and will leave third and short. I'll say this. I think it's, it's so important to pass rush because what did we see last year from Alabama? When Tua Tungabailoa got pressure on him, he was not the same quarterback. Yeah. And LSU's got to be able to do that without sending the house because he's too good. Just like Joe Burrow, Tua will make you pay if you blitz. So that pass rush and affecting Tua down the road and other good quarterbacks in this league is of priority for LSU. Northwestern State went big, couple tight ends, and they run behind him. Fitzwater and Smallwood help open the floor for Anderson. And for Alabama last year on the flip side, you had a guy lined up over the football on every play that was an absolute wrecking yes. ball yes. and destroyed the pocket almost every snap. They bust the coverage again. It's Fitzwater again. Stingley was all over his man, and they faked the pass to Davis, brought Stingley up and went right back over the top. It's really almost the same combination they hit the touchdown on earlier in the game on the other side of the field. Just miscommunication. There's a lot to clean up on defense for Dave Aranda. It's a good week to do so, though. Vandy on the horizon next week, a bye after that. That is the end of the third quarter. Final score may be decided, or at least the outcome, but still plenty left to play for as we hit the fourth quarter, 51-14. Take a look at our 15 minutes or less, brought to you by Geico. Jordan, would you be surprised if I told you Joe Burrow was 8 of 10 for 239 yards across the middle from 10 to 25? No, that means that's 18 such passes in the last two weeks. Only 10 shy of all that they had in 13 games last year. He picked up right where he left off, using his legs down in the red zone, and he was laser accurate. 21 of 24, Tom. 21 of 24. I don't care who you're playing. That's impressive. He's thrown for 373. Epler on the run. The Able to complain it to shorts. You know what's interesting? I, a lot of times when I evaluate quarterbacks and, and when I talk about things in the media, 
people kind of scoff at the completion percentage thing. And I agree, you can go both ways with it. You know, it's not great to complete 80 passes that are five yards and be 80%, but here's what I'll say. At times when LSU struggled last year and Burroughs' completion percentage was 44% against Auburn, 50% against Georgia, it's not the worst thing in the world, but you add a couple sacks, you add a couple throwaways, that means that an offensive coordinator, 60, maybe 60% 60 of the passes he calls are going for zero or negative plays. And that's just tough as an offense to be effective when you're not completing a higher percentage of your ball. And talking with Joe yesterday, he said, look, I didn't complete enough of my passes. Yeah. I mean, he was, and it's also, as you mentioned, it wasn't just Joe struggling. It was trying to round, fit a round peg in a square hole. That offense was not very well designed last year. It didn't give Joe enough options. You know, when one or two wasn't there, there wasn't a three or four. Or the three was on the complete other side of the field. They're bringing routes to his face. There's four and five options for Joe Burrow, which means it can stress the entire defense, and there's more space to find those openings. And you're seeing it in his completion percentage, the effectiveness of this offense. They're explosive. They're efficient. It's a product, uh, product of the scheme as well as Burrow just getting better. First down run. Let's take you back to the studio. Here's Dari. That has turned into an incredible SEC East rivalry. Florida's got Tennessee next week. Seems like everybody's it's like you've been in a three point contest with Larry Bird. Everybody's playing for second behind Georgia. Fresh set of downs, sideline shot. Receiver was out of bounds and it's incomplete anyway. Akile Davis, the intended receiver. And with how Kyle Trask played last year and sparingly and how he seems to be playing tonight, that's not a big drop off from Felipe to Trask. And I think in certain areas, even improve. There's a lot of talent around Trask on offense at Florida. They can find a way to use that. They still have an opportunity to push Georgia, but that gap is awfully large between Georgia and the rest of the East. Remember, Florida walked him off Kroger Field two years ago in the Wildcats failed to cover a Florida wide receiver for the second time that, that night. Timeout taken by Northwestern State. It's a 51 to 14 game. First. Back to Red Come Stick in a moment. Northwestern State. Those their first charge timeout of the half. Back. You can find them on the SEC Network Wednesday at 7 Eastern, 6 Central. You can see them live on the ESPN app as well from anywhere. Tiger Stadium on a Saturday night. And after a sluggish start, LSU found its rhythm offensively behind Joe Burrow. They've turned it over to Miles Brennan now. They've combined to go 24 for 27. Shelton Epler getting a lot of work in against a great defense. And he fires again just inside the 20 for a gain of three to Quan Shorts. Shorts is coming off a game against UT Martin in the opener. He had 12 catches for 111 yards and two touchdowns. Played in the air raid at Texas Tech for a coach who got fired into an NFL job. Can you explain that one to me? Nope. And after 75% of the game last week, I'm still trying to explain it. <laughs> Cardinals did come back, though, and made it a game at the end, but... That offense, I think, is still a work in progress with how Kingsbury wants it to be what it was and what he wants it to be in the NFL. Third down, seven. Epler, corner route, end zone shot, bobbled and incomplete. Tom, you mentioned Quan Shorts coming over from Texas Tech. Got in a little bit of trouble off the field there, but when he arrived at Northwestern State, he himself went to the office of athletic director Greg Burke, and he sat down and he said, I want you to know one thing. That issue that I had at Texas Tech, that's not me. It's kind of in, not the kind of individual that I am. It's not my character. I'm going to prove to you that that's not who I am. He said that he absolutely has from that moment forward. Yeah, Texas Tech, he was charged with disorderly conduct, suspended for a week. No charges were filed. 
Then after misdemeanor marijuana possession charge, Ed June was dismissed from the team. He showed up in Nakadesh late. Shot incomplete. Twelve oh four to go here. Fifty one fourteen LSU drama building in Lexington. I'll tell you about that on the flip side. Well, the crazy thing is now Kentucky can get the ball back down eight if Florida wow. kicks the extra point with 33 seconds left. Sometimes you want them to score. Brennan wants to throw it. And he will lob one downfield. That's complete. And it's a first down on a 28-yard pass to Devontae Lee. You know, you don't want it to look like you're you're trying to pour it on, but th these are valuable reps for Miles Brennan. You can never have too much experience for your backup quarterback. He's talented, and really his his first extended game reps to to really run this offense, you know, since Georgia Southern. But to build on that, he needs it. Emery can't find much. He's thrown down for a loss. You saw Miles Brennan in practice a couple of days ago. What struck you? He can sling it. Remember just what, a couple of years ago or last year when we saw him as well. I mean, the ball jumps out of his hands. But again, it just wasn't comfortable for him last year. He never worked under the gun, just like Burrow, excuse me, under center. So this is what he's comfortable doing. But like in any offense, you need real game reps to start that growth and to accelerate that growth. So these are valuable reps. But he's talented. He can win them games if he was ever needed. Let's hope that never happens because... Burrow's fun to watch, man. Pretty good for the Rocket Chaws back in high school, and he's able to complete that one to Jenkins. Same high school as Doc Blanchard, Heisman winner 1945, Mr. Inside. And Brennan was the number four pocket passer coming out of high school a few years ago by ESPN. 6'4", 207. And they'll punt it away. Over on ESPN, Kentucky's going to get the ball back down eight with 33 seconds left. And they need a miracle to find consecutive wins against Florida. Burrow coaching up Brennan. Zach von Rosenberg punched it away. I think he was in the same high school class as Joe Brady. 33-yard punt. Nothing on the return. LSU put its defense on the field here at Death Valley after this. Roger LSU leads 51-14. Now let's go back to the studio for the comeback moment, supplemented by Aflac. All right, Tari, thanks. That was a crushing loss for Arkansas last year. Bryce Rivers out of San Antonio, transfer from UTSA, is in at quarterback. Southpaw gets swarmed, and he gets dropped. It's a loss of seven. Another massive comeback in the league tonight. Florida trailed 21 to 10 after three. They're trying to hold on for a win with six seconds left in Lexington. Quarterback's first snap in Death Valley, a lefty, and you sprint him out to the right? What are we doing? <laughs> Might as well just 
have the lineman take a knee. <laughs> Just hold up red capes and say yeah, LA. Go for it. Rivers hands it off. A bunch of purple jerseys there. It's a gain of one. Trevor Morgan getting the carry. Bryce Rivers from San Antonio. Arrived in January. Last year started the final two games for UTSA. Threw for 260. Threw for a touchdown and ran for another. The running back Morgan out of Edna Carr, New Orleans. He's on the left side. Third and 16. Timeout taken, Northwestern State. Timeout, Northwestern State. That's their second charge timeout of the half. This will be a 30-second timeout. You know, whenever we go on the road in the SEC, we always manage to have a good time, right? We've had some great meals around here. The, the boat was nice. Oh, always find a good steak somewhere. Harper's haberdashery paid off well. Sushi was good. You do look good tonight. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. But it was our trip to Stabs last night, which really surprised us. You see, in this industry, it's not uncommon that we get recognized in public, some more than others. But when the nice young couple sitting next to us took an interest in our table, we thought it was for the usual reasons. They wanted to introduce themselves to the big guy at our table. They wanted a picture. And here's the point where we apologize to that couple and say, you did not meet Brian <laughs> Urlacher last night. You met Cole Kubelik. <laughs> Cole, have you ever been mistaken for Brian Urlacher before? Listen, I too liked watching 54 run around and make tackles. <laughs> which was the way that I was greeted at dinner table last night. So, one other time in Chicago I actually was. But uh, not since he grew his hair back out, no. <laughs> I didn't know what was happening at first. I'm sitting next to Cole. The couple comes up. and You know, we loved watching you back in the day, Bob. I'm like, whoa, some old Auburn football. Sure, like, that's and that's cool. not uncommon in the right? SEC. Yeah, that's great. And then after dinner when we all took a picture, it was, oh, you know, Ditka and, and I'm Walter Payton. And I'm like, wait, oh, my gosh. They think he's Brian Urlacher. Well, and the first thing was, oh, boy, he walks up, puts his hand on my shoulder. I love watching you play football. I was like, Damn, this guy watched football in the 90s, watching the center at Auburn. He's here in Baton Rouge. They, this is a football nerd. They take it seriously. We had a wonderful dinner at Stabs. It was absolutely delicious, and they couldn't have been nicer. And so we apologize that you're also mistaken. Big chance for a run back on the punt, and LSU is going to take it to the house. 37-yard punt. 53 on the return for Trey Palmer. You just felt like at some point they were going to break it. Derek Stingley had a couple that almost break er, broke earlier in the game. And I tell you what, Trey Palmer was fun to watch in practice. They used him a lot in the slot. He's a great athlete. They'll use him more on the offensive side as the season progresses. But man, showing just how dangerous he is with the ball in his hands. Officially a 54-yard punt return. For Palmer, they've gone final in Lexington. Florida came from behind and knock off Kentucky. Cats go to Starkville next week. Florida gets Tennessee to town. Certainly the Tigers have found their rhythm. Palmer with the punt return score for the freshman from Kentwood. Well, taking it on a spin around the SEC, Jake Fromm was magnificent. Georgia route at Arkansas State. Tennessee finally got what they were looking for. Got off to a great start. They held on for a 45-0 win. I don't know if all's well on Rocky Top, but they're headed in the right direction. Tua had a monster day. Five touchdowns, 444. Tide rolled South Carolina. Well, Muschamp wasn't happy with a couple of the calls in the first half. And South Carolina never got back on track.
so. Are we still on pace for the SEC to get multiple teams in? Well, according to the All-State Playoff Predictor, the SEC has a 63% chance to get two teams into the CFP. That would be better odds than the Big Ten, the Big 12, or the Pac-12 have to get even one team in. A lot of will hinge on what Georgia does with Notre Dame next Saturday night. Well, I know Notre Dame looks good. Ian Book had a big day today, but I just look at that offensive line for Georgia. They haven't been tested yet, and if they need to throw 40 times with Jake Fromm, they can. They're going to be tough to stop. They're so big, so powerful. They lean on you for four quarters, and when they need to, Fromm will dice you up. And it looks like George Pickens is going to be that guy on the oh outside for gosh. the Oh, my gosh. A couple of the catches that he's making. He had a toe-tap catch down the sideline today that looked like an NFL catch because he looks like, even as a freshman, an NFL receiver. Yeah, he does. I'll tell you what, the SEC might not be as deep as I think sometimes from top to bottom we're used to seeing, but the cream of the crop at the top, LSU, Bama, Georgia, they're as good as I think they've ever been. LSU, three national titles. Could this be a national championship caliber team? Play clock at three. Pressure coming up the middle. And they fit it to stop the run. No gain. Erlocker, what do you think of LSU defensively tonight? Tough to get a real read. A little bit disappointed in the secondary, and I know Dave Aranda wanted to mix up some things and do some different things, but they have not been able to get home rushing four. That is going to be a problem when you're going to face maybe Kyle Trask, when you're going to face an Auburn team that needs to put the ball in the air because their offensive line is not opening up in the run game, when you're going to face Kellen Mond, and you're going to face Tua. They're going to have to get home with four or at least five, and they haven't shown tonight they can consistently do that. They are without their leading edge rusher and Caleb on chase on. They are without Michael Divinity, who has shown a propensity to get after the quarterback. They are torching the backup quarterback for Northwestern State. They've been in Bryce Rivers' face the entire time, and that one falls incomplete. And I tell you, Tom, the, the coaching staff was a lot more disappointed than I think myself and Jordan were with what happened in the Texas game. I mean, you got one cornerback who misses a time, missed times a jump to knock a pass down. You got two 50 50 balls. You got one screen that goes for a lot of yards. It's not like they were busting assignments and guys were just running free, running wide open. That wasn't really happening against Texas. Dave Aranda said, I've got all the books and binders, planned everything out. This is what I thought would work. He showed up and hadn't been the case. Palmer returned the last one for a score. Won't have a chance here. But you know what happened in the Bahamas with Hurricane Dorian, and now there's a tropical storm bearing down on the islands again. Tropical storm Umberto. And you have a chance to help the people affected by the weather in the Bahamas. Your donation will help support Red Cross preparation, response, and recovery efforts in the United States and Bahamas. Go to www.redcross.org slash ESPN or call 1-800-RED-CROSS to donate now. See if they keep the offense open for Miles Brennan. He wants to throw. And he completes that pass. Forget that they're still throwing. I understand why. But have we ever seen an LSU team on offense at any point up like they are in this game? In 11 personnel, spread with four receivers. A tight end in there, but spread wide throughout the field, throwing the football. I mean, this is... This is just who they are. This is their identity. They don't get in too tight end. They don't get full back in the game like we've seen over years past. This is who they are. Well, if Les Miles wasn't so busy winning on the road with Kansas, you might be paying attention to it. But, you know, they were so predictable in his final season. They're yeah. predictable by down and distance, by formation, by personnel. It, we know what this offense is capable of. From an electricity standpoint, from a production standpoint, Brennan almost got tripped up, and now he'll scramble. But are they predictable, though? You know what's tough? Um, there will be certain things that teams will find, but I always go back to this. When you 
have so many full field progressions, meaning Burrow can start on one side of the field, maybe as a corner and a flat route. He's got levels, a dig and a drive route and an outlet. When he can work the whole field, there's not a defense that, that can guard that. I mean, when you watch film and you have four or five guys running routes, there's always somebody that is open. And when you have a quarterback that can go from one to two to three to dumping it off, it's tough to scheme against that. So, yes, every team's going to have tells, how they line up their back, what personnel they like passing or running out of. But when you give Burrow the entire field and four or five options on plays, sometimes it doesn't matter how you scheme it up. There's always going to be an answer. So I would say they'd lean towards no. They're going to be tough to scheme against because of that. As long as you can protect it. Yes, 100%. Spoken like... A true offensive lineman named Brian. <laughs> Dare Rosenthal is now in at left tackle. Goal number 54. Well, we mentioned the quarterbacks in this division. You think about some of the defenders in this division. That Auburn defensive line, yeah. Matabuki, Michael Clements. Uh, for Bobby Brown on that A&M defensive line, Terrell Lewis, Sanford e. Jennings, Raekwon Davis on that Alabama defensive line, Jabari Zuniga, Bernard for that Florida defensive line. Now they're they're going to face some dudes that can get after the quarterback. In a play clock situation, they will reset it and roll with it again. How about this offensive production? It is historical. First time since 1930 that they scored 45 points or more in each of their first three games. 1930. The first three opponents were South Dakota Wesleyan, Louisiana Tech, and Louisiana Lafayette. Reversal of field for Jenkins. Got a key but fair block and takes it inside the five and just short of the goal line. By the way, they beat South Dakota Wesleyan 76th zip to start the 1930 season under Russ Cohen. This looks like the kind of play that would happen in a 76-0 game. Again, attacking the middle of the field. A staple for this new LSU offense. Straight ahead. And a lunge at the goal line will put him in a touchdown from two yards out. Tyrion Davis Price, second touchdown of the game. Nice earrings. Those probably got to hurt after a while, right? You get heavy, yeah. yeah. Oh, they do? <laughs> <laughs> you said that like you got experience. Oh. <laughs> This kick might matter to some of you. Miss PAT earlier looms large. Fifty-one point lead for LSU. Well, Ed Ogeron has great history with Northwestern State. He is raved about what the program meant to him as a young player and a young coach. I know that he didn't want to run up the score on this team, on his alma mater, but certainly he had work that he wanted to get done against Northwestern State. Absolutely. I think Ensminger and Joe Brady wanted to see Miles Brennan operate the offense. Sure. Not clean up duty, not handing the ball off, not your basic install concepts. They want to see what he can do because you never know in this league. And, and Joe Burrow's smart enough with his body, with his mind, to protect himself. But you always want to know what you have in the guy behind you, especially in a new offense. What about overall? 610 yards of offense. They've got Vandy on deck next with an early start in Nashville. And the Purdue quarterback the other week throw for 500 and something on Vandy. I mean, this offense right now is rolling. They're going to be tough to stop. Really tough to stop, and it's Vandy's coming at a good time. The bye after that's coming at a good time. Then Utah State, and you're looking at them being four, three, whatever they're at, rolling into what, Florida? Right yeah. After that? And that'll be a Florida team, it looks like, that'll be on its second starting quarterback of the season. Felipe Franks, haven't seen an official report, but based on the injury, could be lost for the year for the Gators. Terry Tom. Wilson out for Kentucky, Jake Bentley out for South Carolina. Tommy Stevens did not look right. They started in this week, but he didn't look like his shoulder injury was anywhere near being healthy, so he didn't finish the game. 
Hide your kids. Hide your quarterbacks. Hey, how about the two guys whose job it is to hold the flags blocking the signals? I saw those. I feel like those are, like, custom made, too. See how they got, like, two stands down at the bottom? And they've got a $28 million facility, okay? They're not going to skimp on ways to block the signals coming in from the defensive coaches. It's great. Hey, Mom, good news. I got an LSU football scholarship. Really? What are you going to be doing? I'm going to be holding up the flags, blocking the signals coming in. Wait, at halftime? No, 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 during the game. Sure. Should have created a hologram. Oh. By the way, that facility that oh. we went in the other day, that is incredible. Among the things they have, lay flat lockers. And when we got the tour of the locker room, there was about a half dozen guys taking naps in the middle of the day. It's amazing. I mean, yeah, you might just think, okay, I mean, what's the point there? But you keep guys around. I mean, guys don't leave to go try to take a nap at their dorm room. Everybody stays. You finish meetings, you finish class, you go take a nap at your locker. Everybody is staying in the facility from sunup to sundown. It's chemistry. It's preparation. A lot of elements. They're awfully impressive. It didn't but, smell like a locker room. That was the best part. Yeah. If you're hanging out in there, you didn't have pads and cleats and everything in there. Spaceship door lets you in automatically. I mean, it's unbelievable. These are the lockers, and, and since they've, they're low profile, you can see the entire room. And they've got guys in their lockers, not by position or not by unit, but simply by numbers. So you're spending time around guys that maybe you don't hang out with during practice. Yeah, the filtration system in there is similar to what you might see in a Vegas casino, and so it smells... More like a, more like your living room than it would a mud room. They could use those on a couple of the boats around here. Yeah. <laughs> Caleb Fletcher is in a quarterback for Northwestern State. You know, if you hadn't taken so much money from them, maybe they could afford it. Yeah, they're not going to have any filtration system <laughs> in, uh, in that anymore. We got a flag down. They also had the... What do you even call that room we went in to watch the, the hype video? Yeah, I call it the hype room. Yeah, literally. Yeah, it was like an IMAX theater with rumble chairs. 270 degree screen. They have a walkthrough room where you can walk through by looking up at a 45 foot video screen and watching the team line up digitally via Madden. They didn't. Can't hide money. No, you can't. <laughs> they didn't forget much. Even Brian Erlacher would be impressed. 65-14 is the final. Joe Burrow, 21-24 for 373 and two. Are there concerns defensively? Yeah, Northwestern State got a couple touchdowns against them in the first half, a week after a Division II school. Didn't allow them to score two touchdowns. It's the 800th win in program history for the LSU football program. Let's take you down to the field. Cole standing by with Ed Ogeron. Coach Ogeron, oftentimes it's very difficult for your football team after a big emotional win like yep. you had against Texas to bounce back the next week. Yep. It's even more difficult to bounce back after a sloppy first half That's of football right. and finish strong in the That's second right. half. What did you learn about your team in the second half today? M maturity, play for 60 minutes. We realized they'll play a little bit better than they thought we would. They punched us in their mouth, but we said we we're going to throw the last punch, and we did. I'm proud of our team in the second half, especially our offense, uh, defense. David Randa made a tremendous adjustment to shut them out in the second half. Give credit to Northwestern, man. They played a lot better than they ever played all year. Joe Burrow may have made one mistake today, but it looks like he took what he did against Texas and literally just kept yeah. it rolling. How do you even describe what he's doing right now? Yeah, confident, mature, senior. That's the way it ought to be. He has some great receivers. We have a great plan. Joe is a competitor. He wants to be great. What does this team need to do off of this win moving forward uh, to finish your goals? You know, learn a lesson that we have to come out and play for 60 minutes. Uh, we know we didn't play very good on defense in the first half. We got to play for 60 minutes. We got to start fast. But I'm proud of this team because we said we're going to start fast in the third quarter than we did last week, and we did. All right, go get some rest. 6 a.m. prayers and then curls to follow. Yes, uh, go Tigers. <laughs> Thank you, Coach. <laughs> Cole did an interview with Coach uh, yesterday while doing curls. This guy put up some strong numbers. Joe Burrow, 21 to 24, 373. A couple touchdowns. Did it in every way possible. Attacked the middle of the field, intermediate, used his legs, pushed the ball downfield. And did that as well outside the pocket.
Let's take it down the field. The result, 610 yards of offense, Burrow and Cole. 610 yards of offense, Joe. Why were you guys able to be so successful tonight? You know, we scored on a lot of our possessions, but I don't think we really played as well as we could have. Uh, I was pretty disappointed in myself uh, in the two-minute drill. I threw a pick into cover two. Uh, I should have seen that guy, so we got some things to work on. We talked during the broadcast about how you guys attack the middle of the field. Is that a part of your plan that you talk about and discuss throughout the course of the week? Yeah, you know, we really just attack the areas that the defense gives us. And, you know, really the last three games, the, open, the middle of the field's been kind of wide open for us, so that we've been attacking there. Now, the run game's changed a little bit from last year as well. You hadn't had the opportunity to do what you did as much. That rushing touchdown, how'd that feel? Yeah, it was good. Um, really, I just do whatever the defense dictates. Um, and he, he went after the back, so I pulled it and kept it. What's the next step for the LSU offense? Now, we're going to have to get better this week in practice, my, myself included. Um, you know, we have a long way to go to get where we want to go, but it's a great start to the season. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. 610 yards of offense, and Joe Burrow, not happy. If they want to be a championship contender, there are steps that LSU needs to take on both sides of the ball. But tonight, a comfortable victory, 65-14. to 14. For Jordan Rogers, Cole Kubelik, our fantastic crew, I'm Tom Hart. So long from Baton Rouge. Let's get you to the studio. Dari, Chiz, and Doring.